All right, hello and welcome to uh, our our second Twitter space for Ether Cosmology. Today we're going to be going over Shane's model. I'm going to join the panel here. Loading, hearing the echo of myself. All right, well, there we go. All right, yeah. All right. I joined on two tabs. So uh, please bear crazy. with us just a moment here, everybody. You sound kind of echoey, Shane. Yeah, we're where, like, where we're are like you you're coming from? Or like you're far away. Where? Uh, okay. Let's see what happened here. Let's do this. <laughs> Wrong microphone. Test, testing, all right. Sound good, Toby. Test, testing. Am I getting an audio am I, a echo from one of you guys? Is that uh, what I was hearing? So it sounded like Shane was far away from his headset or like it was picking up audio from a different source, you know? Okay. In any case, uh, I'll be ready to go live whenever you two are. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in here. To give us just another moment here. We're about to kick off our live streams. Oh, dude, that's so funny. I actually super went live already, but you're good. No, Where did Shane go? No worries. Yo, can, can you hear me? Toby. While we're li <clears throat> while we're waiting, we're gonna listen to some of, <laughs> s some of Toby's uh, music in the background. Mm, oh yeah, I think if I joined on my phone, that would have been better. Well, I think well, Shane is here now. Here now. Oh, is that? Yeah, you. My... Yeah, you're you're right. coming in clear, Shane. You're good. All Toby, right. can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I hear okay, perfect. But I think one of you guys are echoing. Yeah, where is that coming from? I wonder. How many Twitter tabs do I have open? Let's start with that. Test. Uh, Shane, are you there testing? Yeah, I'm good. All right, you hear me? Nope. Oops. We good, right? Everyone's good? Yeah, I can hear you fine. You're good. Toby, you're good. There's no echo. We're all clear. Um, try the phone. Allegedly. So far. <clears throat> uh, how's my stream? All right. Let's bring it in then. Yeah, for some reason, for some reason I don't get I any, don't any uh, of Shane's audio. I only hear Alan. And it echoes when you talk, Toby. I can 
They can hear feedback. Yeah. What's up with that? Is it me too? Yeah, it wasn't doing it before, but now it is. Hmm. What the hell is feedbacking? I'm just gonna start closing stuff. Oh, are you sharing my Discord screen, dude? Is that not sharing audio? Mute, mute that bitch. Yeah, it's muted. Oh. Or mine is, anyway. Yo, Toby, that propagation song is fire, dog. Uh, there we go. All right. So we're live. Everyone's good. Testing. Hello. Yep. All right. So we're live. I'll go ahead and start my stream. All right. I think I was echoing there. My bad. <laughs> we found the problem. It was Alan. Well, that that time. I still only hear Shane through my headphones. Nope, I hear Toby. <laughs> Is anyone yeah. else not hearing Shane? I can hear Shane, and I can hear you echoing now. I can hear me now through you. Okay, change of plans. Yes. Testing. Hello? Testing. Hello? Yep. That's better. Yep. Okay. So we'll just do it like this. You guys just stream. I'm not going to stream anymore. I'm just going to host this from my phone here. And then we can just uh, move along. That that was it. What the hell was that? What'd you switch from? You're off the phone, huh? Yeah, oh, I'm no longer you. going to use my microphone on my PC. That's what it was. Well, I couldn't hear you in the audio from my PC. Yeah. So streaming when I, when I can't hear you is not going to do us any good. <laughs> Right. It's just right. Twitter being, yeah, I don't know. Any case, thank everyone for bearing with us through all the weird technical glitches there. Uh, so we're going to have today a, a talk about Shane's flat earth model. If you want to pull it up yourself, you can go to planar.earth, <clears throat> HTTPS colon slash slash planar.earth, or you go to ADL.place and just click on Shane's FE model, and then you can find the, uh, the sub or the model in question. Anything you want to say, Shane? Nope. Thanks, Toby. Uh, so like all the explanations and premises, and I put out a video explaining it all, and all the explanations are there. So let's just do like a brief history of why we chose to do that. And then we can bring people up who have questions and we can go through it, right? So if y'all don't know Mr. Walter Bislin, he created this model a long time ago where we came to Flat Earth, and I immediately grabbed it and started using it to portray celestial phenomenon on Flat Earth, right? Because when I first saw it, I was like, whoa. That's how all the celestial phenomenon work, obviously, right? So that model to me is like what gave me the understanding of flat earth celestial observation, essentially. So I've always been using it. Of course, they've uh, Globers have always been shouting things. Oh, you can't believe you're using the globe model. And it's like, well, yeah, all observations aren't globe observations. That's silly, right? So there's always been that back and forth. But essentially, it's the only way that I know of to show celestial phenomenon on flat earth so when we put it up we wanted to make sure everyone had the opportunity to do so essentially that's pretty much it who's got who's got some questions who wants to talk okay yeah so if you guys want <clears throat> want to speak or ask questions just use the handshake emote or whatever it is what have you use something involving a hand and somebody will get to you yeah, it's meant to be about the community this event, so let's make sure we bring you guys up here. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. This is to answer all questions, and especially so if, if anyone's been hitting you up in the globe or hitting you up in the timeline, uh, you know, asking questions, pressing you, send them here right now. This is where we can get answers, or what you can do is link that thread, link, link, link their question or whatever in the 
uh, purple pill thing, and we'll we'll read it and go over it and talk about it. So. So to start us off, while we're okay, here we go. We got Chris or Christ has a wants to start us off. So go ahead, Christ. Am I on? Yes, sir. I know. Hello. Oh, okay. Yeah, Alan, Toby, um, and Shane. Been following you guys for a couple of months now, and just really just kind of been lurking. Been a listener. I think you guys are doing an incredible public service. Blown away, just loving the spaces. Um, totally new to the subject, too, so you have to bear with me. I am a complete new at this topic. And uh, I'm on Netflix today, and I'm watching Free Body Problem. <laughs> and it just dawns on me that everything, when it comes to science, especially like extra terrestrial science and science fiction, presupposes that this like we're on planet earth we're on a spinning globe that the solar system do you know what i mean like it's it, this is a completely captured public narrative and uh I, I i would just love to hear about how you guys got onto this subject first because you know <laughs> there's a question in there somewhere i'm sure <laughs> i mean we can definitely do like origin stories and a little bit after, but oh, awesome. well, any... yeah, that's a, that's a pretty loaded question. I uh, Sh- Shane, Alan, one of you guys want to go ahead. I like what Shane was starting to say there. Yeah. I was gonna be like, yeah, we can do like an origin story afterwards, or we can just try to hit model questions real quick. Although <laughs> I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Super, <laughs> super yeah, to no, I'm happy to. <laughs> I, so for me, I, I had, um, I had a brother that was sending me a bunch of stuff about flat earth and about, uh, yeah, just about flat earth in general, really. And I already was super skeptical of NASA for a long time. And so I didn't really think about it too much past that. I didn't really believe in the moon landing. I, but then I basically started like getting annoyed with my brother. So I decided I was going to go, <clears throat> you know, just look into it, find something to shut him up or something, you know, and then as I started looking for that something, I started to, you know, <laughs> really start to see a lot of red flags everywhere I looked. Um, and for me, it was especially I when I realized that when they went to measure the motion of the Earth was when they decided to was like what led to special relativity and like all the relativistic theories. Like when I realized that that was a big click in my brain because relativity never sat well with me. Uh, it never, it's, it's kind of intuitively nonsensical. Um, and so what, what that, that really clicked with me. And so the flat earth things, seeing too far optics that for me took a little bit more di- like effort to get over. Cause it's kind of like an ego thing for me. Like I like to real, to not realize your whole life that like you're on a plane instead of a curved surface. And that like, literally you just never looked at the math to, to realize that you see too far. Like that's kind of difficult, but like to be like, Oh, well, relativity was nonsense. Like that was easier for me for some reason. Like, cause it's just like, I, well, I, I already knew that. Like I, <laughs> like I already knew relativity was nonsense. So, um, yeah, so, yeah I kind of Einstein's theories of special and uh, general relativity. And it's, he, it's gibberish. Like he, do you think he was like deployed to like, cover up you know what i'm saying like the, yeah then we could go we could go on about that all night actually and actually if you want um we can drop you a, a link to a document uh there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of source material on that out there if you want i uh, and there's uh like it's he's good yeah it's it's, it's quite it's skeptical goofy. yeah it's it's quite uh it's quite uh questionable but but just uh, so we don't, don't get too far off in the weeds stuff. here oh no you're 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 great you're great uh but yeah, so um, anyone else have like a question? Ken, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, you want to talk about, uh, got a question or thought or comment? Yeah, um, let me turn this TV off. Somebody left it on. I don't need it in the background. Um, yeah, I, Shane talked about what his model does do because a lot of people were saying, oh, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. 
and I remember him listing a bunch of things that it does, but I couldn't quite catch them all. I think it, you know, what I did catch was it's basically for celestial observations, this, you can track the sun, the moon, and the stars with it. Is Is there more to it than that? Well, it does like light distribution pretty well. So anything that's like observation based and specifically, yeah, like stars, sun, and moon. So okay. eclipses, you, there? you know, yeah. Can you guys not hear me? I can hear you. Oh, could Ken not hear me? <laughs> um, I think... No, I can hear you. Oh, all right. No, I thought, proceed I, thought I, 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 apologize. Can hear me. I, yeah. I do not, but proceed. <laughs> Crap. Toby, you got to, like, rejoin. It happens sometimes in space. It happens all the time on Flat Earth Friday. I mean, sometimes you just can't hear one person. Super frustrating. <laughs> but, yeah, dude, so, like, all celestial phenomena. Like, it's not – what it doesn't do is, like, the map stuff. It doesn't do ground-based things. It doesn't do country sizes. It's not the the geographical flight path per, per display agent, right? It's it's just for stars, sun and moon, celestial phenomenon, the Southern Cross observation – Things that, like, before now would have been inexplicable to most flat earth things. That's essentially what it's for. Am I still speaking? <laughs> no, you're good. Yeah, right. so, so, so to be clear, it's not for... So if someone were to, like, apply flight paths to it or say Australia distance doesn't look right on it... It's not really the purpose of it. It's it's just star observations relative to the lat long system. Yep, I'd say that's the main like the main goal of it is definitely the stars, like to display the stars to show how circum circumpolar stars work, how southern uh, gotcha. optic convergence point and southern pole works. That's a, that's essentially the big one. Gotcha. So you could say that the the purpose of the map in there is just for visual clarity. Right, like oh, you could yeah. you could put any map in there. Really, the purpose of it is just the cord, the lat long coordinate system and the sky. Exactly. Right, yeah, awesome. So, so earlier when you were saying the light distribution, right? Can you talk about that a little bit? Like how they how they explain it on a globe versus what we see on the plane. Right. So, light distribution is one of those things that it shows really well, just because, like on the globe, they pretend that the terminator line is perfect all the, all the way, right? There's that big discrepancy over, well, when the sun rises, it should rise for everyone on the same side of the plane all at once. <laughs> but <laughs> what you get is an equidistant sort of uh, distribution of light like this, right? Like I'm showing, oh, let's see, am I showing something? Yep, By sure. the way, everyone who wants to look at visuals should be watching the stream. I'm streaming to Twitter, I think. And on that stream should be my display over here for what, what we're looking at. It might be a couple second delay. But yeah, so this shows the light distribution perfectly. Like if you start at like Equinox when it is perfectly halfway distributed, then this model shows it perfectly, right? So you can see exactly where it's, the terminator line is equidistant down the middle. And that's, of course, an effect of the sun height. And what the, the difficult thing to, for most people to understand right here is that like this thing right here from the different solstice. So in the summer solstice to us, when the light wraps around like that, like that is definitely an effect. That is how the light uh, looks on, on any map you look at it. Right. So to try and put that on the model, is kind of weird to try and put that on the side. It's kind of weird. That's like that distribution is called coffee cup caustic. And it's probably an effect of multiple things, including some sort of reflective thing in the, in the background. Right. So that's how the light works on flat earth, on regular earth, on globe earth, on any map you want to look at. It always does this right. Matching out throughout the year. Half and then less than half, and then more than half, all the way through. Cool. Well, thank you. So, as the sun is completing its analemma, the light distribution changes relative to that, and that's how we see it every day. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I also show this on that model. The analemma gets shown nicely because it goes uh, in neat little figure eight patterns from wherever you are, as the other part, from wherever you are on Earth, you see it in that way. So, each person would see this at a different spot, right? The analemma would appear. We get our own, we get our own, and we get our own personalized analemma, guys. There you go. Exactly. Very cool. That's how you know the sun's 93 million miles away, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's do, um, before we get into distances for everything, right? Because the, obviously, is this based on heliocentric distances and all that? We'll get to that in one second. I want to bring up Kevin real quick. He's got a quick question for us. Um, let me check the hands. If possible, can you bring up 
All right. I actually don't even see any requests, so it's purposed or it's not. I have no purpose as a mod. That's that's cool. Uh, his his, name, <laughs> his uh, username oh. is mobile something. Did you see mm. mobile something? Can you bring him up? Oh, I see uh, it. I see it now. I, I see it now. That. Approve. Look, I got it. Nice. Mobiler. You hear me? Yep. Yes, sir. Nice. He's got delayed stream playing somewhere. You hear me now? I do, I don't hear you. I hear uh, you mine on my notebook, but not on my phone. That's strange. Oh yeah, Twitter's ass, dude. Um, <laughs> I mean, Elon Musk is cool or whatever. Mars is great. Um, <laughs> we can bring you down and bring you back up and see if that helps. Yeah, yeah, but. But I can ask my question anyways. I, I oh, yeah, can't true. hear you or just yeah, I will ahead. echo, but uh, I will I will ask it anyway. I asked you on on the chat, but uh, Mike, uh, I'm I'm not sure what the distance is um, because the uh, it's about the apparent distance to uh, uh, po uh, Polaris. Um, if we see in. To, to equal distance in every direction, how does uh, visual curving at extreme distances uh, play into into that? Um, we we say that hyperbolic vision makes it makes a difference. We see curved visual, but I don't see how uh, um, how how there are anyways different distances because it should be only one distance um, uh, every every direction, isn't it? Yep, yep, equidistant in every direction, sure. But you're asking like, so what's the difference between apparent and optic, or uh, apparent and actual distances, right? It only goes to below 69 or whatever on, on the, the chart because you're using an apparent distance. So when it's apparently over the horizon, you can't see it. So that distance judgment based on the formula gets skewed, right? You're asking how curved visual space affects it. I mean, that's just in the degree in which it's affected in the far and near field. And essentially, they let you use where it's least affected, right? So that's how they're connected. They just, they, uh, the, the part where it would be skewed, where it would be nonlinear and appears to say logarithmic, then that's when they do corrections to allow you to use the uh, actual angle. So it's, you know, between like, what, 150 and 180 on the other side and 0 and 30, essentially, is where they have used corrections. What, and while you were explaining that, too, you had a thing up to you that, where you were showing that relationship. Oh, I couldn't see that it on one? my stream. Yeah, that's why I was yeah. like, oh, I'm not showing that. No, no, it, it was it was solid on Discord, so it's yeah. on. It's, a, it's in the background. We're good. Okay, yeah, that was the chart we made when we graphed out the 69 miles per degree, which would be an actual relationship we can use on flat Earth because we did prove mathematically that... As you process laterally x along the surface that the personal celestial sphere will move one degree upward or to you depending on the direction of travel right everyone likes to go through that but when you go through the angles there you have to keep it at a forced limit of uh, distance so that's where the 3959 comes in with the good old unit circle just forcing that visible radius along that as we use basic trig to progress from zero to 90 degrees right so that's how we showed that that's definitely possible on a flat earth and not specific to heliocentrism and certainly not due to curvature. Anyway, that was just the chart, the, the graph that would show. Actually, here's the portion where it would be linear, all the, the above 20 and below like 70 or whatever, where they would let you use it. And then beyond that is where they have you correct. And yep, yep. All right, Kevin, was that the, did you get all that? I know there was like a slight delay or whatever, so I'll give you a minute to, actually, I think he already dropped down. Maybe. Nope, he's still here. I'll give you a minute to respond. Did you hear me? <laughs> no, no, he, he did. It's The audio's coming through his other device, so there's just right. a slight catch-up mechanic. But um, 
Yeah, here he is, here he is. So, so what's the what's the apparent height chain? The apparent height is for every star, or is it for for Polaris only, or um, in 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 this in this in this scale in this table? Apparent height is all you ever deal with. It's all we ever see. It's all any person ever sees or deals with. So it seems silly to work with anything else. And that's uh, and the actual height is where you find the sixty two ten and all the other variables, not in the actual perceived height, right? You know, it's so long for of a delay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Why is the apparent height given in miles? You couldn't you? Is isn't the miles the apparent miles in the dome always the same? Couldn't you only give angles? Well, you give apparent angles, which translate to apparent heights. Oh, uh, we have, you guys know who F6F5 Hellcat is, so what's the request to speak? Yep. Cool, cool. One second, I might be able to get him. I'm actually able to mod from my computer today. This is working out really well. You know what? That's awesome. <laughs> That's the good thing. Sometimes Twitter spaces don't fucking suck. You know? <laughs> Welcome. Did anyone have a question about the model or anything? <laughs> what do we have to ask our own questions? I think we're just shooting the shit at this point. No, you're good. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think there was, was there one more from Kevin? I think you had a follow-up too about how we derived, how Shane derived the, uh, the radius for optics and all that. I know that's not specifically model related, but it is, it is kind of related because it, you know, Celestial sphere and whatnot. Would you mind giving a a quick explanation of that? Yeah, we actually just went to who was the clubhouse on meatballs. I think meatballs here. Meatballs should come up. We went to a meatball space to do a nice dissertation on that to answer a challenger from a PhD or whatever, and that was pretty fun. I recorded that. We should put that up in a little bit. But essentially, was it to do with? Uh, the radius criterion and the wavelength and diameter specifically chosen, or was it something else? Yeah, yeah. Now I hear you uh, at the, the right time. It was Ruhif at Jaronism. He said, uh, "Yeah, when you have a telescope, it would skew the whole thing, but it's it's meaningless anyways because <laughs> the 1.22 anyways remains with uh, with the eye." Yeah. So that radius criterion with 1.22, that, that's just, that's a scalar, right? It's a, it's, first of all, it's a ratio and it depends on the starting criteria. So you can choose a different wavelength. You can choose a different aperture. Sure. But then it would scale covariantly with the rest of the, the variables. It was pretty funny because you can actually derive it backwards. You can derive the angular resolution limit in degrees or radians backwards using the radius and the apparent drop rate. So like to say that you can choose different variables to negate the whole thing is silly. Perhaps they're unaware that it goes, you know, back and forth, to and fro, left and right, et cetera. So let me find find the wonderful formula that'll help you derive it any which way you want to. All right. I think it's um this is this is the biggest criticism that I've seen come out of or or you know put forward for what Shane is uh, is putting forward is that if you change the optics it somehow changes everything right but it's <laughs> it, you can derive it from the other variables though yeah and when you change from a human eye to a telescope sure you're increasing you're like you're increasing resolvability by changing the wavelength and the diameter. The di like literally the diameter is how telescopes work when they change it so drastically is how they see larger objects and essentially what radius criterion really is meant to describe is this intercedence point of these two objects between you know where you're viewing and when you're seeing like so the, the your eyeball and the object has to pass through this aperture and then they go through this divergent connection where that divergence will go far further or nearer depending on the diameter. So that's that's all that is, right? That's a specific frame of optics and changing that won't change anything because if you move from a human eye to a telescope to a camera, that portion gets covariantly scaled. So it doesn't change the giant end of the end result of it. It just proportions it because 
they're using the distance to the horizon as the next part. If you change the aperture, can you see further? Sure. Does that increase your distance to the horizon? Absolutely. So everything scales covariantly. Hold on, let's get the formula that's there because I think it's really funny that you can literally have a, an a absolute variableless constantless formula that shows all this relationship perfectly. And I think it came from, I don't I think Toby said he made it. It came from one of us, I forget. <laughs> it is, oh man, it's beautiful, right? So R meaning radius equals D, which would be the distance to the horizon over tangent of theta or the angular resolution limit. Let's go ahead and put that in the chat up here. Oh, I can add it to the comment for space. It's perfect. So we'll throw it in there for everyone to see. Have fun. Ooh, I'm going to need you to meticulously tag that, brother. I'm just kidding. I'll do it after we're done. Yeah, you have to tag everything. You're right. But yeah, definitely. Well, you can edit, actually, so it's not a big deal for you. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's right. Because the, uh, the actual, like, oh, I can't edit that. Whatever. The when you, <laughs> Nice. When, when you get the radius down to, like, the actual degree of specificity, it's when you choose the human eye in 1.2 and the red, red, orange wavelength for light, which is literally like the most persistently resistant to refraction at surface level, which is why we chose it to be the mean average of all the criteria and circumstances to get the best possible result. But if they don't like that, you can backwards derive it from your chosen optical drop rate at whatever aperture or diameter you're working with and including the radius to get the actual resolution limit where it would not become resolvable. Anyone on the model? <laughs> I'm going to check the timeline here and see if we got any questions or something like that. So we got a muted lad. He says, coffee cup caustic effect. What the F did Shane's explanation make any sense? Yeah. Mm. So would you want to touch back on the coffee cup caustic and how it's the... I think it's like a representation of the limit of our of our curved visual space, right? Now, what they say for the like for the globularist explanation, they say that there's ice crystals in the atmosphere and it's causing this weird, you know, light pattern situation, right? Oh, that's for sun dogs, I think. Oh, is they that not that. is that not the same yeah. kind of is that not a coffee no, well, coffee cup caustic? Uh, it's like a reflective issue for sure. But like, yeah, they say ice crystals follow the sun when it has those three suns when it looks like it's being reflected mm. or whatever it has. Like, no, no, those coffee, those ice crystals stay perfectly static in the air and then follow the moving sun all along its path. And that's why it looks like that. And you're like, ah, yeah, that's retarded. Okay. Oh, um, my bad. I thought, I thought those were the same thing, like just different words or whatever. No, coffee cup caustic is like that stretching effect of light bending around a corner, but not really a corner, uh, around an angular or whatever because of it, uh, has a reflective part essentially, right? It's they did it because it's called coffee cup caustic because someone saw it through a coffee cup or something. I forget. I think Wichit said that. I have a good visual image of it somewhere. Let's see. Is this it? What the hell did you open? Oh boy. You got one, Alan? Does anyone get Toby? Do you got one somewhere? Oh, dude, my mic was muted the whole time, and I was talking to no one. Fantastic! All right, so yeah. we got some, we got some we got some mics here. So P Dubs, you pulled up. Do uh, you have a question, sir? We can go ahead and get to that while Shane is looking for coffee images. <laughs> yeah, do you think you guys think that it's possible to measure distances on Earth somewhat accurately? That's an excellent question, bro. I think that it is, but I don't know how if anyone ever has. All we've ever done is map globe distances, dude, on long, like map, very short oh, sorry, distances. Map what? I didn't understand. We, we've, we've only done globular distances, right? So there's a coordinate system that yields different distances that is the same in every map that's on, that's on Google Earth. It's on every metric and way that we use to compare distances. So whenever we say, hey, how far is this? We're citing and calling the same coordinate system. So like... I all the, all the, about coordinate system. I was just asking if we can measure distances on Earth. Yeah, it I mean, sounds like yeah, it sounds like maybe you didn't get it though, like because all the distances would be from the coordinate system, right? Unless you want to measure. No, your, with not your at feet. all. Not at all. Not a, no, oh, no, 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 no. Which, no, which one? Saying at all, Shane. It's like 
before we even had a coordinate system, we were able to measure distances. Well, and we've been able to measure distances since the Roman times, right? I mean, there's oh, a Roman crazy. mile. And we've known the Earth is a globe since then, too, I heard, don't no, we? No, I didn't say anything about the globe yet. Oh. I just, oh. I'm just asking if we can measure distances, and you gave, like, a whole word salad about globular All distance. Right. So can we measure distance on Earth or not? Where are, are you? Are you, are, are, you on, though? Are, are you looking for reference points between two places or what? Uh, yeah, eventually, yeah, we could do that. Oh, man, like, no the the, hmm. the the distance from the North Pole to the equator. Like, we, can we agree on a few things? Or first, like the North nope. Pole is at the center of the circle that is the equator, the zero latitude line. Oops, that's loud for everyone. Huh? Is that something we could agree on? Did you have questions on the model, bro? Like anyone? Oh, you mean, you mean Walter's model? Was... The model, yeah, the model. Right here, this Wal model. Walter's model. Well, no, my model. It says change the model. I, I have a question. Oh, model, you just changed a couple numbers on. Did I? Yeah, it sounds like. Well, did you prove it? You I know what I'm talking prove, about? Prove it to who? To, to who the hell are you talking to, man? Who the hell are you? I'm not trying to prove that you stole the model from Walter at all. Who stole anything, dude? I, I, I didn't say you stole anything. I asked. Did you want to talk about map distances some more, or did you want to just... I like... mean, I just asked if we could measure distance on Earth, and apparently this is a big conundrum for you guys. Yeah, if I asked yeah, a normal person hard. around if they could measure Super distances hard, on Earth, dude. they'd probably say yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can all look at Google Earth, right? And we can do geodesic well, arcs. Look, we can use the hammer the sign basis? to get the what difference the between basis? two points on the surface the of a sphere. We can compare geodesic basis? points for Google Earth. We could do a whole bunch of long lat convergence. Hey, we could even go in the tropic and do a complicated conversion to get the actual GPS coordinates from the length. If we know that backwards, backwards to and forth, right? So, so the, the the length of the meter and the length of a nautical mile both have their origins in the distance from the equator to the North Pole. Agreed. So you said measure distances, and then you want to reference a coordinate system. And then you say, well, I'm oh, not no, talking yeah. about a coordinate system. But it's like you're very confused here. And if you don't, Let's get like, some we're, else like, yeah, we're going to wrap it up, B. All right. There was somebody else who chimed in and had a question. I, I had a question. For some reason, my audio cuts out um, when you come up on stage. I have an Android. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. It cuts out sometimes. It's called the Elon special. <laughs> okay. Anyways, I, I just had a question. The the Bislin model was open sourced, is my understanding, which means, you know, it's open source. Um, what changes did you make to the model uh, source code? And I think you published that, right? You got a link to the actual source code you modified. Hold on, my dog's going nuts. Uh, yeah, while he's getting his dog, I'll give a brief answer on that. Yeah, it was, uh, what's it called? Common license or whatever it is. Or I forget the terminology, but yeah, it's it's open source. And Shane has published it, and he'll get a link for you when he comes back. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Shane, I have a question, though. If the Earth is flat, I mean, is there an edge to the Earth? Like... If we reach to the edge of the earth, what would happen if the earth is flat? Yeah, one second. Hold In your dog. model. One, one second. Uh, Shane, can you answer my question? He's AFK, sir. Can you hear me? Like any flat mall, like flat earth believers, because I I can't even define if it's yo flat he, around away from hey, the keyboard. Brother. Can you, can you guys hear me? Could you let him know that uh, Shane's AFK? I'll be back in a second. All right, should be good unless he comes. For, eh, we're good. All right. Two okay, yeah, Shane. Shane, yeah. Can you answer my question though? I mean, since you have the flat earth model, right? I think Shane so. is away at the moment. I think we're having some technical issues here, and I believe Shane is not available at the moment. But if, to mm -hmm. answer your question, um, I know. You just like, got back, Toby. Me, oh, okay. Toby can't hear me. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah, you're good. You're good. 
<laughs> All right, okay. So you're no longer AFK, right? So you can hear me, right? Yeah, it sounds like I don't want to have to answer any of your questions. So we should give it to like people who are serious and have real questions. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty serious, like because if they're just flat, yeah, right? That means it sounds it like you're edge. a globber and it's not really well. For you. Okay, sure. So yeah. basically, right? Any flat surface has an edge, right? Great, good question. You gotta step down, please. <laughs> okay, so you can answer my question. So that means you're more. I don't really give crap. your questions, man. All right, we're here to answer questions for people who have them. Okay, and so he how has do you a find question, a question? So answer his and how question. Do you, yeah, and how do you how do you find a question that's genuine or not? If it's flat, do we fall off the edge? Is not really the kind of question we're here to answer, bro. So why not, sir? Because that's retarded. Hey, that, why it's, it's retarded, not? Hey, listen, listen. It's not the purpose of this space. Let's not detract too much. If you don't have a specific question regarding Shane's model, that isn't what happens when we get to the edge of the model. We'd be happy to accommodate. If you have no further questions, then we're going to have to rotate oh, okay. your mind. Oh, okay. So you mean to say that the model has an edge too, right? <laughs> yeah. So what happens if we reach at the edge? Well, what what happens if we reach the yeah, edge? Yeah, I, I can't see who's talking, so I'm just going to shoot yeah. first and ask questions later. Okay, are you trying to psy up me I'm, again? Like, is it I'm like a mind stone. game? I am the son of man and woman, bro. Yeah. Trying to figure out what it is you you, you really answer a question you about a place we can't go go to. I mean, that's. <laughs> First of right. all, I would right. he's, he's asking first thing I would say, never been there. As far as I know, we can't actually go there freely. So there you go. Appears to be Boy. a big ice shelf. Dude, I thought we would have had more questions by now, honestly. Let's see. There was <laughs> what did I see the other day? Okay, who was the guy that had the uh the grid turned off and his compass out and he was saying that <laughs> it was all stupid? Let's cover that real quick because that was a big that was a big deal. So somebody yeah all right 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 somebody said the it didn't quite match the sun in australia but what they did was and by the way the whole purpose of this model is that this personal as a grid shows the apparent position locally for each observer so what they did was they went ahead and turned that off and then they said it doesn't work right so they did this sort of thing with no personal so so this sun is being observed by no one and they went, look, it's wrong. It doesn't work. You see, it's sun's over there. And you're like, oh, that's the single most retarded thing and most retarded use I've ever seen of this. But yeah, boy, if you put on if you put on the, the actual personal grid, which is the whole purpose of the model to show you where you see celestial phenomenon locally and optically for you, then it will show you the apparent rise of the sun. Essentially, this model is so good at sunrise that up here in the top, it shows the elevation and azimuth of the sunrise for every observer all over Earth for three years. So the one thing it's excellent at, he's like, boom, what? I'm like, okay. All right, buddy. That's okay, though. Sit down. Oh, okay. I got to follow up. So one of the questions asked earlier was, what changes did you make to the model? And do you have a, a link for the <clears throat> for the open source of it or anything like that? Yeah. We published it. It's also a tab on my database. And... All the descriptions are on the database and on the website as well. And you can also just do what uh, Globers did immediately and like, what is it, F12 view source or whatever, <laughs> which will show you the JavaScript there too. What were the changes that you made, if you don't mind? I don't know if you guys can still hear me or not. Yep. Well, I tried to turn off the bendy line. We had to change the radius of the personal grid. The actual translation method of GPS from bigger to smaller, uh, this bigger sphere to smaller sphere. <laughs> I left all the distances to the sun and the moon because they're just translated through a conversion factor to an optical size, which is all based on diameter of the sun. Of course, that's because the sun and the moon appear at 0 0.53 degrees, which can mean through a series of covariance scaling any number of distances and masses. So that's not a reliable way to determine anything nor does it mean or necessitate any sort of direct distance. So that's that's crazy, but that's still in there because just because it gives some credibility to the optical diameter of the sun as it appears in your personal grid. So so every every person in the model has a different view of the sun, is that correct? Is yeah. that what they what what I mean by personal um, what is it per personal celestial view or sphere? 
Yeah, there's there's all sorts of names for it. Like I think Jaron called it a while back, the personal at- atmospheric dome or whatever. But it's all concepts of the same thing. It's all different names for the same thing. Azimuthal grid of observability, azimuthal grid of vision, personal celestial sphere. Take your pick. They're all kind of the same concept, different brandings. Now, do you want to real quick touch on the mechanics of that on how it's derived? Because it's like, isn't that just word salad? Isn't that something you just made up so you can role play as a flat earth machine? Or is, <laughs> or, or is this an actual optical phenomenon that was used to derive the sky founded by the Royal Society? Right, right. So that relationship, which is why we started with the 69 miles per degree, because we got asked that question right away. That is where the whole disagreement started, right? So they essentially said, well, we know that the uh, stars and Polaris declines one degree if we go a certain amount south. And we go, okay, well, we're going to say that that is because of curvature, even though buildings, tall buildings, mountains, tall people, things, everything in the known universe also recedes into the horizon with distance proportionally. But we're going to say that's all for perspective and that the stars do it because of curvature. And you're like, okay, that's great. So the main disagreement and the disagreement over perspective with uh, regards to the stars between globular and planar is literally all oh, that can't that relationship can't be that that the stars can't recede into the horizon for any reason other than curvature and essentially that's absolutely wrong right we mathematically we've already proven as i said as you progress laterally you know at 69.07 statute miles across the surface then the personal celestial sphere will move towards or from you depending on your direction of travel that is just how it works. So essentially, they backwards engineered that and told you that actually, instead of that happening the same way as it does for all the other things, uh, that's because of curvature. And literally, behold, the world around you is curved. That was the basis of the uh, globular, I think, deception, I think. All right. So to kind of break that down, the stars in the sky are apparent. The distances to them don't really matter. To establish a coordinate system but in which two people can use to circumnavigate on at great distances, you can you can set up you can use like an apparent distance based off of that uh, sixty nine mile per degree relationship, right? And that's and that's exactly what they did, right? Yep, exactly. Uh, okay, so go uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, when when we start, I, I don't know where I read it, but I was uh, I I was under the impression that uh, like with the stars or whatever, uh, someone suggested that we have like a I, I don't know, it was like a six thousand mile diameter view something of of that nature and i'm wondering you know if that isn't the the cause of it to fall because like if i'm presumably if i'm standing at the north pole with polaris directly over my head it's not in my view unless i look straight up but as i recede more of the sky that's above me comes out into my view and as i back away it will you know, more of that sky keeps coming in and that Polaris will drop even farther because it becomes part of part of my overall view. And it, 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 is that kind of what the, because there's like two domes, the celestial dome and then the personal one that's there. Is that kind of what that is? We only have a limited view of that entire dome. Yeah, that's a pretty good description of it, man. Like, if you're underneath Polaris, as you progress towards the equator, yeah, it would uh, it would appear to recede. We can actually do a quick little demonstration of that, if you'd like, which we can look from, we can bring the observer under Polaris, and then we can pro- laterally pro- process him out towards the equator. And as you get half towards the equator, Polaris would appear to dip to about 45 degrees on the observer's horizon, so it's no longer directly at your zenith. It's about halfway, and then when you get to the equator, it would be almost at 90 degrees, and you start to see the other antipode, which would be, you know, the uh, southern rotation, which would be an optical convergence point in the in the apparent south, only visible in the south while facing south. And then you can go even more south there, and you can see just the uh, southern rotation because Polaris would no longer be visible because you've transgressed past its elevation angle right so if it's if it's just that angle that elevation above the earth if you go further than that away from it you shouldn't be able to see it anymore that makes perfect sense hey do you guys hear me you guys hear me yep yep 
Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, maybe were you talking earlier or were you just muted? I, 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 I might have been. I'm so sorry. It's like the first time I'm trying this out. Damn. Yeah. Uh, if you want to talk, uh, remember to hit the unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> so my bad. <laughs> Uh, I, I just posted a, a model that I, I made in Blender um, on, the, on the page. Uh, so the guy that was asking about uh, what's beyond the ice wall, he can, he can check that out. But, you know, it, it doesn't show like stuff beyond the wall because we don't know. But it shows that it's possible in a model of a flat earth with the sun moving above it and the moon, and the moon moving above it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys saw it. No. And Blender's cool, though. Yeah, I love it, man. I wish I could use it. <laughs> is, it, is, it is it hard to use, or is it... Yes. No. no, no. <laughs> okay, well, you need uh, a PhD. You need a PhD for Blender. <laughs> okay, well, then, fuck me. No, it's open source, and... There's a lot yes. of great tutorials. It's a bit intimidating, but you know, if anybody puts in some time, it's just like with anything. You just got to put in some time. I'm learning it myself. Yeah, I started. At the moment. I started last year June, and I'm I'm pretty good so far. It's not that bad if you check it out. Yeah, that's awesome. I just played yeah. it. That's that's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Nice. I made some other models. Um, the first one, the first one I did was. Uh, I, anyways, I don't want to cut you guys this time off. I just wanted to say something about the stars. Um, I live in the Caribbean, so I live in Aruba. That's like twelve degrees above the center line of the sun's path, quote unquote equator for the globe Earth, right? Um, I see, I see. I, I'm in between the two tropics. I'm in between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. Uh, the guys, if you guys are from the U.S., you're not going to be seeing the difference. You're not going to see the sun move to the north and then see the sun move to the south. But I can see this. During this, during a whole year, you can see the sun moving to the south and then back to the north, right? If you think of, and I have this model out, and I wish to bring this out one day. I'm, I'm actually doing some. <laughs> housework right now but if i was sitting by my computer i would have shown you guys some crazy stuff if you, you think of the whole heliocentric model and how the sun is in the center and how throughout the year where you know the sun is moving to the south and then to the, back to the north what is what is weird is is that you don't see the stars moving with the sun's motion it's it's kind of weird you, you, you see the sun moving all the way to the south, and then it starts coming back in January to the north, right? It moves all the way to the south in December the 22nd, and then it starts coming back until June the 22nd, right? It's all the way north. But when I see the sun moving south, all the way south, um, after that movement, I start seeing the three kings move to the north. To the, uh, then I start seeing the three kings move to the south, after when the sun is coming back to the, to the north. And that doesn't work on a heliocentric model at all because it makes absolutely zero sense. Hmm. I, I guess I, I guess it's difficult to explain with words. I have to show it with like a blender or something like that. But I don't know if you guys... Do, does anybody... Can anybody like... No, nah, you, you gotta model it out, bro. I can't... I can't visualize yeah. it. I'm so and bad at that. You should hang out with us since you're a blender guy. We don't have a blender guy. We need one of those, I think. We need a blender <laughs> lab. God, that's awesome. For real. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, sure, man. I'm, I'm working right now. It, you know, if, if I had free time, I would I, I could be chilling with you guys and showing you everything. <laughs> I even I even model out how a shooting star would work on a globe earth and on a flat earth model. And it doesn't work on a globe right. earth model. Nice. Because every single meteorites or shooting star should be coming from the horizon and shooting shooting upwards. Yep. But we never see that ever. Yeah, that's a good point. So, I wish it says that one a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have I have a really good model model that shows that. And if I remake a model light right now, I probably would make it way better because I I I gain a lot of knowledge with Blender. So yeah. Yep. But oh, yeah, uh, I, yeah I can... go ahead. The sun's path is a good thing, though, a good thing to talk about because it's one thing that the model does really well. 
and you have to like angle it right. Like what I'm doing it right now, I'm looking at at a side angle and you can see the sun not only doing its analemma from from uh, summer to winter, but it also goes on a tilt. It goes inward and higher and outward and lower. And also, of course, you have the outward tangential velocity appearing to be faster than the inward, but really it's just like a clock hand going the same speed, right? So that's the wonderful thing to show in the model. And you can see the sun dipping in and around, up, up and back. And there's a good video, I think, that Habitat put it together called Ecliptic Overload, which literally has the sun all over and over and over, showing the analemma, showing the path, showing how it looks to each observer, which is really cool. Yo, yeah, that reminded me, by the way, I didn't really get to talk earlier because we were having some audio issues, but um, I heard the back and forth going on, uh, going about the apparent sun, and I just wanted to chime in on that. I, uh, you know, what, what the refractive index, the idea of light curving downwards is, you know, is somewhat true depending on where you are on the earth. Uh, and, and more importantly on which, uh, you know, quote unquote layer of the atmosphere that you're in, because as you go up and you get, uh, you know, out of our, our lower atmosphere into the higher, higher layers of the stratosphere and the ionosphere and, and such, uh, the troposphere, the refractive ind indices actually flip flop back and forth. So sometimes the light's curving upwards, sometimes the light's curving downwards. And when you consider the fact that light is bending downwards by the, when the sunlight gets to your eyes, it is a matter of fact, measurably that it has refracted downwards. And so you're not going to see it no matter where you are on the earth, you're never going to see it in its real position. <clears throat> and to take it even further with starlight, it's the same thing. You look at Aries failure. They did an experiment, a very simple experiment to tell whether the starlight had already moved. But when it comes to our eyes, to our optical viewpoint here on the earth, they filled the telescope with water and then they compared using the, you can, you know that the light is going to ref bend in a certain way. It's going to bend upwards because of the, the speed is going to change with the refractive index of the water. And so thus you should, if the starlight if the earth is moving and that's what's causing the starlight to come in at uh, a different angle, then you'd have to bend the telescope because it's like uh, you have to account for your your literal movement. But we didn't have to. Airy didn't have to bend his telescope, which means that the starlight had already been the movement of the stars. The movement of the sky has already occurred when we see that light. So we're not seeing the stars in their real positions either. We're only seeing them in apparent positions. And that's because these things are coming through layers of atmosphere. And when you think about it, you know, maybe the most simple way to think about it, one of the analogies I've used recently is you think have a bunch of people stand around a pool, an empty swimming pool, and you throw a quarter in the in the empty swimming pool, and then you have everyone triangulate triangulate that spot of that quarter in that swimming pool. And depending on where they are, they're all going to get their angles. They're all going to look at it and they're going to say, okay, yeah, we know the quarter is there. But then when you fill that, that pool with water, or better yet, let's say you fill, you fill it with some really thick uh, salty water or something, and then you have everyone do that exact triangulation again, you're not going to get a clear position on that quarter because you're going to have refraction of the water that makes the quarter in an apparent position for everybody looking at it. So to try and expect us to be able to triangulate exact positions of things in the in the stars without knowing what that measured medium is without even even taking into account what we do know about the measured mediums about the the uh the layers of refra the, the way that the refractive index is going to change in each layer of the atmosphere uh taking all that stuff into account we know for a fact that these things are in apparent position so to try and tell us that uh, oh, the ground beneath our feet must be curved because we can't tell uh, exact positions of things in the sky is really quite uh, asinine and quite uh, quite uh, misleading. You know, I would say you shouldn't really. That's there's one. That's one of the many reasons that we shouldn't be using the sky to make assertions about the ground beneath our feet. Damn, that was great, Toby. Yo, thanks. <laughs> Well said, man. And off of the back of that, I'd like to continue and further say that the distances to the stars. So earlier when we were talking about um, like the apparent position and whatnot, how they do, how they made it for navigation, right? They assume everything's close and local, right? None of these crazy heliocentric distances, right? And the reason for that is 
because it, the angles have to match up for a two-party system, right? Now, when you get into the role play of heliocentrism, you can use those same stars and start getting distances based off of the assumed motion of Earth as the baseline for the triangle. And then you could actually have, you can, you know, then they can present their triangulation of star positions that are light years and light years away, unfathomable distances that don't actually matter. But it's nice and fun for everybody to calculate it out and it looks pretty, right? But the fact of the matter is the meaningfulness of the stars comes from a close and local, you know, analyzing them for what they are, an apparent position that you could use to uh, for navigation with the two-party system. Yeah, apparent is all that matters, right? Apparent is all that's ever ass. used. It's Sorry, just, yeah, you have a loud-ass uh, keyboard. It's also right next to the mic, so it's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> but So, like, apparent is all they ever use. There's a nice post from NASA that Gleam turned us on to where they were showing the, the phenomenon of the supermoon or something, and they were using a dome around the observer to show how it would uh, how, how it would look and how it would work. And then they it was uh, hit so hard by iffy flat earthers that they removed it, so it's only on web archives. But NASA treats it that way. We treat it that way. Celestial navigation always treats it that way. They only treat the stars as a static web of uh, objects that never change distance, even though they think the distances are billions of light years away and independent. They're independently different distances all across the world. How would they use a web of inter <laughs> different distance dependent things to navigate anywhere? That's retarded. I don't know. They <laughs> treat them all as a static web that moves with you just like we do. So yeah, apparent is all we use, all we need, and all that's needed. Well said, man. Let's see if we got any questions or hands. If anyone has a question or can do a hand emoji, I'm scrolling through right now to see what's up. See what we got. Got a couple of requests to speak I can approve here as well. Go ahead and definitely some Globers out there. <laughs> I see Bradley, Latahana, and Run Boston. It looks like they got their hands up. I think Bradley was first, then Nahana. Bradley's a global isn't he? Yeah. Um, as I look at one of the pictures that are are on your model page, it looks it looks to me like the sun and the moon are inside of the dome, the firmament. Is that correct? How how did you get that from this? Where do, where do you see the firmament line that you can tell that the sun is below or above it? Maybe I'm not looking at a picture that you produced. I can double check. I thought there was one. Well, let, well it doesn't matter. Just is the sun and the moon inside the firmament or outside of it? Mm, I don't know, man. It's a good question. I know that what we see is like an apparent version of that. Where the source is, I mean, that's uh, anyone's guess, I guess. Okay. So wait, hold on. Anyone's so guess, moon... I guess. Yeah, hold anyone's on, guess. Hold man. on. Hold on. So if the moon is Why in the hold... firmament, right? According to some models that I've seen, then that would make landing on it a lot easier than we've been led to believe. What? Yeah. Well, does anyone mm. else have any model? Oh, Liliana or Liliana, did you have some questions? Okay, or, or just just ignore what I said. That's oh, we will. I'll chime in if 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 Hanna doesn't mind me skipping her. I totally want to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to be rude or anything. I mean, I I know the elephant in the room is flat Earth is stupid, and you know obviously the sun, moon, and stars are really really far away. But what we're postulating here tonight is that. What mankind has seen since the beginning has always been apparent. Like the sun, moon, and stars has always just presented itself on the limit of our vision. And I know it's really confusing because people that are looking into the shape of the earth, they hear that we're inside an enclosed dome or a firmament of some sort, which we can't get to. Like we can't get to it because we can't go past the ice wall of Antarctica. If we, could, if we could go, we'd love to, but like what's up in the sky, like what's up there, we don't know because we can't get to that part either. And somebody asked earlier, well, what is this azimuthal grid of vision? What is this perspective dome? And all that is, if you simplify it, is just human beings looking out into the world. So anytime you have a human looking around 
at the night sky, that is that person's personal vision. And it, and it ends at some point. We don't see, you know, 20,000 miles or 10,000 miles. We see 3959. Now, that happened way before any theory of where we lived. Um, that, that was going on with humans before anybody even wondered, well, where do we live? And the globe model was created by how we see the world. And what Shane's been trying to say is longitude and latitude was built as a system. And all maps that you've ever seen in your entire life are the same thing. The 220 conversions of the same map are like the exact same coordinate systems. And I'm not trying to be silly or anything, but why people are so interested in this topic is because obviously it's not a spinning ball in space. Some people still think it is. Some people think that that is absolutely the truth, but all measurements, all data, all looking into it shows that the earth isn't moving and you can't find curvature anywhere. So we're trying to get into the ins and outs of how do we see the sun to each apparent, like to each person, what is it to them? Where is it to them? And like he said a second ago, oh, hold so on, it's I, the hold moon, on, hold, hold on, on. So five more seconds or 10, 10 more seconds. So somebody said, well, if the moon is underneath the firmament, it'd be that much easier to go land on. But what we're saying is the, the moon is presenting itself apparently. It's not something that's, I don't think it's something physical you can go and touch. Yeah, well, please explain how something that isn't physical has obvious craters on its surface. Well, I would say right now that no one has been there to touch it, measure it, scoop it, take a picture of it. Like the scientific method you can't do with these craters that you think you're seeing. Uh, which, which would name yeah. Yo, yo, about. one second. On. We're hardcore detracting into something that's not really the subject matter here. Right. So, but thank you, JT. That was an excellent, Thanks, excellent man. explanation a- of the situation at hand. And as far as moon craters and optics goes, maybe you can catch that one on the next Ether Cosmology Twitter space, brother, when we talk about the moon landing when Demon Stride uh, hosts it. <clears throat> so, oh, hold on, hold on. Nope, this, nope, one, won't no, be holding on. Is it model thing. related? Yeah. If it's not, then there's no holding on, and it's Leona's turn. Thank you, sir. He is he is on his way out. Thank you. Like like uh, Alan said, come on back when we do uh, the moon landing presentation. The Steel Man of the Moon Landing, brought to you by Demon Stride. Nice, thank you, boys. Yeah, let's hear from Liliana. We text have her texting all the time. We've never heard her speak. What's up? Hey, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yep, you're good. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a question about the stars and Shane or Alan or Toby or Ken or whoever, you you know, welcome to let me know. You know, I love watching these um, time lapse uh, of the night sky with the stars. And I've noticed that in a lot of the like still photos, um, the stars, like you think, OK, this one star is making a line, right? Because it's it's captured so many of the time lapse. and it, it, it's just a still photo of, of a time lapse. And so what I noticed was that a star will make a line. And of course, different stars will make, you know, that curvy line um, um, of different lengths. Uh, but what I've noticed is that it there rarely is it one cohesive circle from beginning to end that you can clearly tell that same star is making. because all the lines are different thickness, you know, because it depends on uh, the brightness or the apparent brightness, or apparent size of the stars, right? And um, so my my uh, guess was that perhaps what happens is that certain stars go out of our field of vision, outside of our dome of vision, and then other stars come into our dome of vision, and um, so, you know, that's the reason that they're not just all perfectly round um, circles. They all kind of break up. And, and you know, to the naked eye, it just if you're not really paying attention, it just looks like circles. But they really are not. If you look at a still photo, you'll know what I mean is that you can tell that it's not the same star making a completely round circle, even though round circles appear to be there but it's really other stars that are picking up 
the anyway so i i hope i made myself clear and i hope the question is you know has some relevance to the topic being discussed thank you and sorry <laughs> i mean uh, star trails time lapse is a function of a camera first of all it's not like a thing that can be observed it has to be manufactured right so First of all, that's, that's one thing to point out when you're doing star trails, they can't actually, you, you put a, a camera out there for a short amount of time and you hit the star trails button and then it pre completes the circle, so to speak. But you said that you, you watch them as different lengths. I've never seen that. I've watched a lot of star trails. They always look the same width to me, but knowing that it's manufactured from a device could probably hinder that a little bit. I mean, I was always mystified as how they never interconnect. Like how, when you do star trails, there's never an intersection. They're always in the same circuit wheels upon wheels, as I think as Ezekiel's wheels put it way, way back when. And that's something I think that ultimately brought me to Flat Earth for sure. So relevant, eh, not necessarily, but super cool. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question on the model, if it's okay, uh, regarding uh, the angular diameter of the sun, which is around what, 0 0.5, 0 0.53? Um, does the model, um, I haven't looked at the model in detail, by the way, so apologies. Uh, does the model account for the two minutes that it takes for the sun to disappear behind the horizon? Or, you know, roughly, it depends where you are, well, on Earth. <laughs> and, and depending on where you are, it could be anywhere between two to three minutes. Um, does the model account for that, the, the two to three minute delay in sunrise and sunset, which of course has to do with the apparent sun and apparent sunset, right? Does the model account for that? I don't know, it's a question. Shane, are you, is your mic on or? muted on Twitter. You mean like the the apparent pause between dusk and twilight? Is that what you're referring to? I guess uh, if you look at, you know, I've seen lots of videos where they film the sun right before it disappears beyond the horizon. And my understanding, at least with the globe interpretation, is that because the sun's diameter is 0.5 or 0.53, that, and the earth is rotating at 15 degrees per hour, when you divide 15 degrees by that angular diameter, that's how you end up with the two minutes. I was just wondering uh, if the model accounts for that or how does it account for it, uh, for that delay? And also it's a delayed sunset too, right? In other words, uh, there's a claim that you're seeing the sun two minutes before it actually is visible on a sunset and you're seeing it two minutes after it's actually set because of the diffraction uh, causing the apparent sun to actually be in a different location in your eyeball uh, than it literally is physically. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So that's from like, I think the dusk and don't, the, the time difference between the North and the South, when people were talking about like the Terminator line issue, how it wasn't exactly definite and it became down to, well, and our argument was the South appears a longer dusk and a longer twilight than in the North. And is, does it account for it? Well, it uses timeanddate.com. So if we were using timeanddate.com to establish those discrepancies, then it would certainly be accounted for in this model. Yeah, because I've seen I've seen videos, you know, where uh, I want to do this myself. I don't have a drone. I wish I, I want to get one. But what you could do is if you have a really clear line of sight, like in the ocean, Hawaii would be perfect because people have mentioned that there's very little refraction because the water temperature and the air temperature are kind of very constant. Uh, if you wait just for the sun to touch the horizon, right, and you start a timer and you measure how long it takes for it to disappear, you know, just go below the horizon. Uh, my understanding is approximately around two minutes, two to three minutes, depending on longitude, I'm sorry, on latitude. Um, and also on, on the sunset end of it, that you're, you know, there's a two minute, you're, because of, of the refraction, you're seeing the sun two minutes before it actually is where your eye thinks it is. And when it sets, you're actually seeing it two minutes after it's already set uh, because of that refraction. Now, I just wasn't sure how that's handled in the model or even if it is handled for that matter. 
but you yeah. can do it with a drone. What you do is you wait for the sun to set, right? And then you take the drone up really high again until the sun is, appears again. Mm -hmm. And you get it to be right on the horizon again. And then you start another timer and you'll see it'll be two minutes. You go up another, I forget how many feet, but you can you could get it to do that multiple times. And it's always about two minutes or so, depending on where you are in latitude is my understanding. Right. Well, then that wouldn't work here because this only uses one height and it's sea level and it doesn't go very much above that. But it would use everything from timeanddate.com, which interestingly, when portraying the sun, has to draw a azimuthal grid around each observer and then parade that grid around the, around the map so that it can properly account for the sun's path and the sun's light, et cetera. So it's using the same thing as we're using, essentially. Yeah, we've got a lot of people here. There's 100 people in here. Who else wants to ask questions? We had a question from an ionized cat in the chat. <laughs> wanted, wanted to know if it was possible to swap out the map in the model because it would be cool to show other map displays. That is a good question, TBD, <laughs> to be when, determined. When are we going to get an expansion pack to the model <laughs> where we can use modular map systems and stars, et cetera? Dude, I'm well, how about the video on. game? You got you guys got a blender, dude. Now we could do a video game, right? Oh, that's <laughs> right. Uh, well, we just brought up uh, Bert Pasquale, I believe. Although, no, oh, yeah. Are you here, Bert? You have a oh, question? By any chance? Yeah. I think we can rotate JT's mic out too. He's going down for the night. Oh no, he said he'll be back. My bad. Good. We love JT. That's that's the mayor of Flat Earth. In case you guys didn't know, we got to treat him with respect and <laughs> whenever he's here. Yeah. In case you guys didn't weren't aware, he is the mayor. Yeah, All right. Someone's mic sounds a little rainy in the background, a little staticky. So yeah. if you could mute while you're yeah. waiting, that would be preferable. But um, I think you did say you had a question. So go ahead and then make sure you mute up when you're done. Am I coming through okay? Yep. Oh, hey, microphone. Hey, yeah, I just met Shane the other night info about uh, the next C again. And uh, I was uh, listening to what you're talking about earlier about the current position, and I just wanted to uh, steal me on that for you a little bit. Um, a few years ago, I designed a camera that got installed on the uh, Keck telescope uh, in Hawaii. The big yeah, well, 10, one of the big 10 meter telescopes. Is it uh, part of the optical design? All right, go ahead. Can you move your mic a little closer? Uh, hold on. Let me you, you are coming in really broken up, brother. I had to switch to headphones to, to get a better signal. Something about the, the, the speaker on the Android that hoses when you don't have headphones. <laughs> Well, I was actually using ear pods, but is this any better? Much oh, better. Yes. Way better. Oh, my uh, God. Thank you. God bless. Right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, I just got rid of the ear pods and, and just speaking straight to the phone. Um, yeah, so I, I, I worked on a optical design for a camera that got installed on the optical bench at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. The, the, there's the dual big 10-meter telescopes up on Mauna Kea at um, 14,000 foot elevation. And one of the really interesting things um, is that I had to put in what are called atmospheric dispersion correction prisms into the optical design for the camera. Um, because what happens is if you're magnifying something and you're looking at it off at an angle through the atmosphere, not only is there a slight um, apparent position difference from you know the actual angular position that it would be but it's slightly different for different wavelengths and in essence the atmosphere is acting like a big prism and you get a red red fringe on the bottom and a blue fringe on top of whatever you're looking at and so you, there's actually some uh, pro prisms that you rotate and cross disperse to anti disperse uh, the atmospheric effect 
And so these atmospheric dispersion prisms um, have to be used uh, judici ju judiciously to correct for that um, chromatic uh, disper uh, dispersion. And the effect goes from no effect if you're looking straight up, because then it's like you're looking straight through like a plate glass window, to a you know very strong effect if you're looking off near the horizon, because then you're looking at like you're looking sideways through a plate glass window kind of thing. And the total effect was such that near the horizon, you could get almost half a degree of angular deviation from the actual de actual position. Um, so what you were saying about uh, apparent position versus actual position is correct. And just to quantify that, it, it increases rapidly as you get down to the horizon to a maximum of about half a degree uh, deviation of apparent versus uh, uh, actual, which I think was the same thing that uh, was just being discussed about uh, that the sunset happens about two minutes, uh, two and a half minutes uh, after the actual sun would have gone out of field of view. And uh, but uh, that these uh, this dispersion is uh, you know a, a smaller effect than the half a degree, so just a couple arc seconds. Um, but that's about that's about it for the power of atmospheric dispersion. Well, excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thanks for putting some numbers on it, man. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, and and even even amateur um, astrophotographers who have like maybe an eight inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, if they're uh, really magnifying like Jupiter or Saturn or something, they they'll even use uh, commercial atmospheric dispersion prisms uh, to get rid of the red and blue fringing. Um, tying that into the uh, topic of the room, um, as I've kind of like poked around a little bit more the past uh, few days even with uh, the flat earth uh, model, I'm interested to how, how Shane, how you would um, answer the, the kind of uh, overall question. Um, in the, I forget, what's it called, the uh, personal sphere um, that moves with the observer, personal celestial sphere. I forget yep. how that. that yeah, the, yeah, your right. azimuthal grid of vision, your personal. Yeah, just any any word, any yeah. verbiage you like. Sure. It's fine. Right. So as as I, I played with that for different positions uh, on the globe and such, I was struck by, like, if I move the time of day around and let the sun go around and watch the sun project onto that personal vision um, and, this, and if I turn on the stars and then do the same thing it's interesting that that personal vision is kind of the same motion derived from the heliocentric model but then it actually works out that in the flat earth model that's what you get in, in your personal space and my question is what's the mechanism for that, that it converts the flat earth model with the sun moving around and such, and the stars and the dome. What's the mechanism that actually makes that work? Thanks. You there, Shane? I noticed it looked like you had dropped. I can't tell if you're bugging out. You can hear me right, Alan? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if Shane, I'm going to try and invite him back up again. Uh, I'm going to cancel his co-host invite and then re-invite him. Um, but to answer your question, the, the, the mechanism is, uh, is perspective and the fact that you can't see forever, essentially, right? I, uh, Shane, are you back? Uh, but so essentially, if you think about it as something moves away from you it gets smaller and that's because it's moving into a wider field of view and as something moves into a wider and wider field of view it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller because you're taking in more information uh your resolution is going to shrink as your field of view grows and so then 
uh, eventually you're going to hit a point where something has shrunken out of your field of view. It has compressed so much that it's gotten to a point where it is no longer resolvable at all. It's like being less than a pixel on your monitor or like less than a pixel on your phone screen, right? Like once you get down to that point, once you go below a pixel, you have nowhere else to go other than to just disappear from vision. And so that's what things do as they come in and out of your field of vision. But then to add on top of that, you have to think about the fact that you're standing on a plane. So everything you see in the sky is a plane above you uh, at a great distance. But then every as the uh, but where you're, you're from your vantage point, it looks like we do have Shane back. But let me just finish the thought from your vantage point as those things rise and and come above you and then set beyond you. What's actually happening is just that you are standing on one plane and you're looking up at the other plane and it's uh, it's coming into your field of view and then it's above you and then it's sinking out of your field of view. And if you think of train tracks, the way that they converge in the distance, essentially, you would just take those train tracks and turn them on their side. And then that's how you get your horizon. Essentially, you'd have those train tracks converging, those two planes converging in all directions around you, uh, except that you, you're standing uh, directly upon, you know, one of them. So you're, you're limited, especially, uh, to that, that line, your, your dome of vision is limited by the ground beneath your feet, essentially. Okay. I mean, I, thanks for that. That kind of gives the explanation I've heard before about, um, about the perspective, about the things disappearing at the horizon and such. But, uh, my question is going a little bit deeper. I'm, I'm asking maybe a PG 13 question here. Um, as I, as I studied the flat earth model and I was looking at that personal sphere and moving the time of day around and such, I was seeing how the sun is projected onto that personal sphere and moves around that sphere at a constant speed. Um, and I saw how the star fields are projected on that personal sphere and move around at a constant speed, which of course is what heliocentric models would say. Well, of course, because the Earth is spinning at a constant speed and everything is at a great distance, and so you see it move around at a constant speed and at a fixed uh, angular relative position to each other. So if in the flat Earth model, that is what is apparent within the um, personal sphere, what is the mechanism to make it happen that way when they're distributed over the dome, uh, not in that way when the sun is going around in an angular way that is not constant to that angular space in the personal sphere. How, why, why, in other words, why does it match up to the heliocentric uh, spinning Earth field of view, you know, perspective, but it happens on the flat Earth? That's my question, I guess. And well, so, is, there, is there a mechanism to describe that bending of the rays to get that? Are you asking in terms of the model or in terms of reality and actuality? Or both? Uh, I mean, I think he's asking for that. both and about the bendy light rays, it sounds like. <laughs> so, Shane, if you want to give a quick rundown on that. So, like, observations of the sky are not heliocentric exclusive. When you say it matches the model, you mean it matches observable reality, I presume, because that's all we ever see. Of course, the globe model was built based on observable reality and particularly built upon the observations of the celestial heavens, right? When they discovered a Polaris elevation equals latitude in, in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, they would use that, right? So when you're saying it matches up constant speed, well, 15 degrees per hour is, of course, what we measure, give or take, with interferometry at higher level to show the actual movement of the sky is about that at average. So when we say, hey, that matches it, can we say it matches heliocentric model? Or do we say it matches the observations from which the heliocentric model was drawn? Uh, what else did you say about... The bendy light rays. Yeah, essentially, <laughs> Mr. Walter incorporated specifically for this map projection and not the other 201 map projections. And for this map projection, when you force the actual observations of daylight patterns onto it, he thought that it required the superfluous bendy lines to make it look retarded, whereas the other maps displaying the same light pattern wouldn't need said retarded lines. However, this one definitely needed it. Now, essentially, they're just there for no reason. They serve no purpose. They do nothing. They don't infer anything. They don't show anything. They're just superfluous bendy light lines to show that we don't understand a light distribution or a coffee cup caustic effect. Now that you mentioned bendy light, um, um, the uh, the curved curved visual space, can you 
uh, can you explain how you see how how you think the the curved visual space is is a factor with with for example stars over 70 degrees i find this argument pretty pretty great because because it's it against the globe and uh, um, so why do you think it's it's uh, uh, yeah I, I would like to see the visually maybe it's not possible to, to show it right now but but you think it's it's a uh, it's the, that we see like curved uh, when we look up yeah and that's why we can explain it so so there's there's a little bit of a, of a curved curved view when we look look up you you mean yeah what? yeah a hundred percent so if you can click on shane's name right like on twitter you'll be you'll see that he's streaming if you can click on that you can see the visuals that he has for it so what he was asking shane was um you know how the vision scales uh, what is it logarithmically at six, past 69 miles or whatever oh, he, yeah. that's what he's asking about so if you could okay yeah uh, let's see here hmm there's a lot of visuals to go through. Look at all them. And it's right up here. <laughs> There's nothing like the sound of a good mouse wheel turn, honestly. Like I'm not into I'm, I'm not into far. Dude, I'm not into ASMR, but like if I like hear it <laughs> hearing that mouse wheel turn, like I don't know. There's something about it, man. It's just very soothing. All right. So from the spreadsheet that we drew up to do the 69 miles per degree of the personal celestial sphere with the enforced limit using the unit circle, <coughs> pause, we discovered that this essentially is the answer, right? Can you guys see this? Yeah, you can. So we graphed it out and it has a linear basis, essentially above 20 degrees and below 70-ish there. If you didn't know, you would, you know, if you weren't using a linear function, you would think it was linear. All the uh, elements would be linear literally the difference would be negligible until you get past a certain point. So past 70 degrees where it levels out there becomes nonlinear or approaching the limit, but never reaching it. Something like a logarithmic, but not with the actual value. So what we have then is the linear portion or a logarithmic function that is linear for a main portion, linear portion of which you're only allowed to use. And when you don't use it, you're, when you do use it past the threshold, they give you these giant correction tables which themselves scale logarithmically to approach infinity. So this, the, the closer you get to zero, the higher correction you have to make. The closer you get to 90, the higher correction you have to make. Now, good old Bacon, our good friendly Glober, did let us know that you can, you can do it above those thresholds. They just recommend highly against it. Fair enough. Thanks, Bacon. But you said, how does the non-Euclidean visual space occur? Well, essentially, what they deduced from, let's see, the alley experiments was that, you know, you would see, and they applied geometry to it, that you'd see in the far field differently than in the near field. And they would think they went uh, parabolic to hyperbolic to uh, hyper, uh, no, was it linear to parabolic to hyperbolic at extreme range. So they, they essentially denoted the near and far field as different geometric expressions. And then we would say that that sort of fits with something like this. If this is the near and the far field distribution, then they allow you to use the linear portion or where you would see it linearly, essentially. Awesome. But is, it, aren't, the, aren't the stars, uh, we, don't we always see it on the, on the edge of our vision? That's why I want to make a, a real life model also, because for, for the sun, this, that's clear for me. For, for the stars, I'm not quite sure, but like like uh, the main criticism what i heard is like uh how can some light from outside um project on our edge of vision and so i would like to make a real life model to with with a smaller um lens than our eye is you know that and then we could uh, shine a light um from from far high up on uh, down to our, 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 our on the edge of this of this lens, and then we could prove this concept, um, uh, or we could do something uh, like uh, uh, with with fog with fog light uh, to, with to to dim the to dim the vision to also do this. But the the small scale lens would be uh, would be an idea for for a real life. Uh, model or have have you thought about real life uh, small scale models uh, of uh, to, to prove your your model? 
No, but there are other Halas models that already proved a light distribution thing, right? There's a nice one from the, I think the Sun Never Sets one, where they re reference to the angular resolution video and document that literally shows a demonstration of a local light in a warehouse being moved, you know, along a flat warehouse floor all the way to the end. So the light that it sheds becomes literally indistinguishable and unresolvable. Or as we discussed with our PhD friend last night over at the, the, the Clubhouse app, if you have a car at night with headlights, uh, you won't always be able to see those headlights. They will go far enough where they will become unresolvable and you'll be unable to see them, right? That's the limit. That doesn't mean they went over an earth curve. If you're looking at a desert, that means that they became unresolvable into the darkness. And the same thing happens with the sun. Yeah, it would be cool to play around to see when, at which distance you have to, uh, uh, where you, you have to circle this light to make it equal the same size. And then, you know, this, just an idea to, to when you have a very tiny uh, camera lens you could decrease the the edge of vision uh, an eye so i i would like to the calculation how uh, how far out you have to go um this would be easy with your form formula if you have a, the the tiniest camera on on w w what's technically available right now then you probably only have to go like uh, a couple dozens of uh, meters up or uh, and and you could already yeah maybe maybe a couple of miles you have to go um to have a real life model would be uh, would be uh, good to play around because when i share this 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 uh, domes um and and with a flashlight above you you don't always see it completely uh, um, equal this light and so there's always uh, critics of this how you you think you can make this this light really um uh, same 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 size um or at least put put a camera in this in inside of 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 uh, of these these bubble bubble uh, glass things and look at uh, how it how we can make this light uh, same size but it's just, just future projects I'm down. We need more projects and more experiments and more proactive flat earthers, man. What else we got? Yeah, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Anyone else have any questions or thoughts about the uh, the flat earth model, Shane's flat earth model? Yeah, I had a follow-up question if I could. This is Bert. Uh, sure, go ahead. Thanks. Um, so uh, when I mentioned that uh, the star movements would match that of a heliocentric, you know, spinning globe and, and Shane, if I understand your result, your reply was, well, of course it matches. They made it match the observations. So I think we were in agreement that a spinning globe would give the same view. But my question is still this um, in the personal space. It gives that, um, you know, star field, the sun moving in that, uh, in that view that matches the heliocentric model. But I'm still trying to see what would the mechanism be that would transform the suns going around over the uh, flat earth and the star field. What, what mechanism transforms it to match that constant rotating around for everyone's personal space because everyone's tilted a little bit different depending on where they are uh, longitudinally, latitudinally. And the star field, the way the light would get from the positions on that on the dome versus the positions of the sun which is moving around inside the dome, there's a, both those are like two separate uh, transformations but they have to overlap and so I'm just trying to See, do you have an explanation of what that mechanism is to make it look like, you know, the view from a heliocentric uh, spinning globe? Well, let's ask you a question, man. How would it look like if you lived on a plane with a viewing radius of 3959? How would that differ from a globe that you can see it on? Uh, explain that question a little more. Sorry. Yeah, so you're asking all these questions comparatively to your mental idea of what it would be on a flat earth, hence why you need these mechanisms that are self-evident and explanatory. So, like, how do you think it would be different if 
Instead of on a globe, you lived on a flat plane with a viewing radius of 3959 around you. How would it be different? Uh, I guess what I'm trying to match up in my head is... It would be identical the is the answer, right? Star, the, what, sorry, what? It would be identical is the answer, right? That you didn't answer. It would be, it would be, it would be identical. Um, no, no. I don't see that it would be identical yet. I'm, I'm not there. Um, so if the stars are fixed on the dome, right? Uh, and that dome rotates every 24 hours, right? Uh, four minutes stars. slower than the sun's sidereal time, yes, sir. Uh huh. And the sun goes around the, I don't know, you'd say the height of the sun versus the height of the dome, etc. The different people on different positions on the flat earth would see the sun relative to the star field differently at different angles, so to say, different perspectives, different parallaxes. And They're the same thing. Right? And same also for the moon. Things. Right. But they would be very different, it seems like. And I'm trying to figure out how the ray you know, how your perspective to these objects going around over the flat earth versus the objects on the dome don't have radically different parallaxes for different people, say in South America versus North America versus Australia, um, on any given night. Um, does that make sense? No, so but I don't know. I don't know where you're getting that. Some of it's in a firmament, established in a thick, and some of it is rotating freely above us. Like we didn't declare any of that. We're just saying everything is up there, and here's how we observe it on the ground. So I don't know where that basis comes from. Man. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, we, like in the heliocentric model, the moon's what quarter million miles away, and someone in North America and South America observing it simultaneously um, can triangulate it and, and kind of get the angular difference and, and say, okay, well, that makes sense geometrically uh, to the heliocentric model. But someone in North America, South America on the flat Earth, if the moon is, say, above them halfway, they're looking at it Doesn't at it radically move? different angles because it's so near. It's a near moon, right? And so the perspective of the star field projected out wherever it is on the dome, beyond the dome, I'm not sure, it would be like the moon would be in a radically different place. Like if there's a screen behind, if you're looking at a TV screen and there's an object between you, but there's someone to your left and someone to the right, they would see that object very different places on the TV screen behind them because the TV screen is close and the moon is close, the, uh, the object is close. Do you see what I'm saying? There's like a parallax that I'm still trying to work out. How does that work in a flat earth model? Parallax? How does parallax work in a flat earth model? Is that so, really the question? For, for the moon versus so, the star field behind it. Well, and dude, the, why the, isn't it radically different for people on different parts of the flat earth? I mean, the moon local being parallax. I mean, that's a crazy thing you're throwing around. You know, that there's like a rocket. That's a completely legitimate question. Yeah, well, please don't interrupt. Sorry. Shane, what were you saying? Oh, uh, you know what? I think he just crashed out. I just, yeah, his computer just crashed out. So while he's rebooting. Sorry. Yeah, you would have to get into, so the sun and the moon are the same size, right? So the distance derived would, for your parallaxes would be the same. That's the conundrum that Red's rhetoric has been in since Jaron pointed that out to him like six years ago. So like the Paramax uh, measurements for the globularist have assumptions built into it, which confirm the globe when you look into it, but it's all based off of angular size. So it doesn't really, doesn't really prove anything one way or another when you realize it's all apparent anyway. Uh, well, I'm not talking about the size of the moon. Um, I mean, that's another issue is that you're at different distances on the flat Earth versus a far, far away moon of a quarter million miles. But I'm asking about like, um, like I've seen videos where someone, North America, South America, they both take a picture of the moon at the same time and then they send them to each other. And the moon is slightly different position relative to the stars. Um, and that works out to the angle of the distance of like 6,000 miles versus 25,000 miles, uh, 250,000 miles. That small angular distance matches the heliocentric model. But if on North America, South America on the flat Earth, and say the moon is above them, uh, say near Central America, right? 
they're looking at them radically different angles, like, you know, 45 degrees to the north versus 45 degrees to the west, to the south. And the star field behind each one of those views would be completely different. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to figure out how that would work in a flat Earth model. That's not really... I, I haven't seen a mechanism in that. And I've, I've been playing around with the website a little bit, and, and that I can't quite figure out how that would be addressed. Well, that's a model, right? It's not going to address the function mechanism for reality. I mean, it's going to do the model. It's going to do the JavaScript portion, which would represent, you know, the microcosm of whatever effect we're trying to mo emulate. However, uh, I, my OBS crashed. Did he elaborate on his question or are we still? Yeah. So his question was about parallax and the moon and how you can take different, you can have two people in different locations in North America take pictures of the moon and triangulate their distances based off of the apparent size right. of the moon. Well, oh, I'm not so... saying like from North America or South America, the star field behind the moon, like where is the moon in the stars, right? Um, it's not very different, but it's a little bit different. And that matches if you're like, say, 6,000 miles apart on a globe and the moon was 250,000 miles away. But I'm trying to figure out how that then matches if you're 6,000 miles apart on the flat earth, the moon is 4,000 miles or however many above, but radically different views of ang angles of views, then why isn't the star field behind it radically different? Because you're kind of looking at it from different perspectives. Does that make sense? No. So, is it, is it, so it's like, let's, let's say you're looking at a big screen TV or better yet, a movie theater. And, well, how about how, better yet? Better yet. How about because we've already we, you already kind of explained it. I, I do follow, but I think this would be better if you just provided your source about the triangulation so we could look at that. Right. OK, I'll, I'll find it. Give me a minute. Well, like, again, this is assuming that we everyone knows the distance to the moon. Right. But there's a wonderful observer when they launched a rocket in Arizona and they could see the moon clear across the flat earth and would have been right through the bottom of a ball over New Zealand. So if we can see the moon from Arizona when it's over New Zealand, what does that say about the distance that you think it's at? Anyway, the apparent is all we ever use. So when you're saying when we triangulate, that's a crazy thing to assume because all the globe did was move those distances that wouldn't match up for any observer to a near infinite distance so that they would in fact match up. But those vectors don't actually solve any equation. That's just like a mathematical cop out. So. But I mean, like, would we be able to see the moon when it rises? Of course. Of course. Well, I don't understand why you think we wouldn't. Or I don't, I don't understand what you're looking for, to be honest. Even though it's I the, do like you. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I, I do too. But it, he's, he's hung up on the triangulation and the distances, though. Like, once we get over that hurdle, he's, he'll be set. But anyway, I've seen... Oh, sorry. Did you have anything you wanted to add on to that before we move on? Um, yeah, I mean, I've... Again, my, my question is just how does the field of view change? Let me let me just finish this one real quick analogy, and then you'll understand at least what I was asking, and maybe in future conversations uh, we can come back to it. So if a movie theater is just showing a, a star field on the, on the screen, and then someone puts a balloon up in the uh, fifth row, and you're in the uh, tenth row behind it, you see, you know, you take a picture of the balloon it's in a certain position relative to those fields, but someone to the left of you and someone to the right of you takes a picture of that balloon and it has a completely different set of stars behind it because... Yeah, parallax relative to the stars. We get right. it, dude. We get right. it. Linear parallax relative to the stars. We get it. Yeah, yeah. So how does that work out in the flat Earth model? Well, if you, I don't know if you were here earlier when we talked a lot about apparent positions in the sky. I talked about Aries failure and how the stars aren't even in their actual positions. We see them in apparent positions and about how there's multiple layers of the atmosphere, even in your model. And in your model, the multiple layers of the atmosphere have inverse, have uh, reversing uh, refraction rates going up and down, up and down as you go through the different layers. So everything that we see in the sky is objectively in an apparent position. So your uh, your assertions about, you know, matching the heliocentric model really don't mean much, right? Because we, we already explained that everything we're seeing in the sky is apparent. Now, if you wanted a mechanism, I can spitball you one. It's based on Hildegard's model back from, I want to say, the 1600s or something like that. Hildegard proposed a, a geocentric model. It wasn't a flat Earth model, but it was a geocentric model in which there were multiple layers of ether wind. And that's why the moon 
and the stars and the sun have different uh, different levels of aberration, and that would explain why you would see different layers of uh, you would see what you would what you would describe as um, as parallax due to that, but it really it's just different uh, different indices of refraction, right? Different ether winds, ether flows that those objects are in. So that would be a mechanism to explain that, of which we could come up with a bunch more. Uh, but you know, it's it's kind of just a bunch of uh, guesses about what's in the sky, which I personally don't like doing a lot of. Okay, yeah. And by the way, I, I was the one who earlier um, mentioned that uh, you do get a dispersion effect as you look closer and closer to the horizon. Uh, but that um, the refraction and dispersion is almost negligible looking up or say off to about 40 degrees off from up. Um, and even down to the horizon, the cumulative effect of any of those layers of atmosphere, or if you call it ether or whatever, are only account for about a half a degree of uh, refraction downward. How are you possibly uh, going to make that assertion? Uh, How are you possibly going to make that assertion? Uh, Based on uh, what? By, by, um, follow, by following the uh, movements of the stars, if they're a constant speed. So you're making, you're uh, making and, assertions and, about where the stars actually are by, by measuring their apparent positions. This is, you're, just, you're just using circular logic here. Let's, uh, let's uh, no, no. What I'm, what I'm saying is this. They're, they're constant when they're up, and then you see them start to slow down a little bit at lower uh, elevations. And also you see the dispersion where the red and blue separate a little bit. Yeah, uh, so and that's that, going to be that related to the, the, the logarithm, the fact that it goes from a linear scaling to a logarithmic scaling as you come into the horizon, right? And that's going to, which makes perfect sense because you're getting into a nonlinear drop off as things converge. Out of uh, into out of your field of vision, right? As things as those things are getting further away and sinking into the horizon, that drop off is going to be nonlinear. Sure, yeah, I think it's actually more of a sine sine effect than logarithmic. But uh, yeah, you get a. But I'm I'm agreeing with you. But I'm saying the cumulative effect of any of those layers of any of those indices um, is at most half a degree near the horizon, but it doesn't deviate. Uh, the constant angular spacing between stars. So like you can look at star A, star B, and say they're one degree apart, and as they get lower and lower in the horizon, they don't really change that one degree. It's a very constant angle um, until they get down lower, then they might start to compress together a little bit. Yeah, but but okay, so we're, we're going in a circle again because I've already explained, right, that we're going to have a totally different, we're going to have different layers of refraction. It's going to be a different... Uh, you're going through multiple layers of atmosphere, and until you can go up and measure what that actual thing is and what that actual distance is and what you you have no expectation, right? There is no expectation we can provide without knowing what the physical, you know, what that physical thing is in the sky and how far it is and by which um, through which medium it is being hmm. it is being observed. Well, I would submit to you that that uh, angular uh, positions relative to one another. Are a way to measure the effects of, of whatever those layers are. Um, there are a way that we can observe yeah. them, but then to yeah, sure. then to try and make deductions about what what the well, uh, the material makeup of those things are in the, the anything more any assertions beyond angular size and observed luminous luminosity any absurd, any assertions beyond that are just stabs in the dark and you could you could compute them in a in a multitude of ways that are utterly meaningless. Well, I, I would submit to you that they're meaningful if you can model it, say, using Snell's law and uh, the properties of what, what we know about air, for example. And those um, uh, those modelings work out really well. Well, that's an assertion. The... I mean, some of them well, do. Well, I'm, I'm sure. saying they do. I'm saying they do as far as like the distance between you know, angular uh, ratios between stars as they Yeah, and we could, we could change a few of those and, variables. If we change well a few of those variables, we just have to change a few of the other variables. And then we, that's why, that's why even in your model, right, they've changed the distances to the sun and the moon numerous times because all you have to do is adjust the scaling. It's, it's utterly arbitrary. That's kind of the whole point of this whole thing, right, is that we can take, we can take your sky model and map it to essentially any map that we want because you're just looking at kinematics of observations in the sky. And to try and make assertions about the chemical, physical makeup of those things, the physical size of those things, and the physical distance of those things is just, it's, you know, it's, it's not fruitful. So, yeah, okay, uh, um, I right. looks like Shane bugged out. Let me get him back up here. Yeah, all, all I was saying is that it's a good measurement of the overall, you can, you can measure the overall effects. That's all I was saying regardless of what the uh, material, actual materials are.
Yeah, but you get, you got what I was saying, right? That if you change one of those variables, all you have to do is change other variables. And it's if every if you if you're making stabs in the dark about material makeups and sizes, then you know it's it's not very fruitful. Well, no, it's, it's not stabs in the dark to say we have very accurate measurements of these things. I think you is he roboting for you as well, anyway. Dude. Yeah, he robot it, and also I'm gonna leave real quick and rejoin because uh, what's it called? It's uh, memory leaking or whatever. Yeah, and I can't. I don't see Shane with the request up actually. Oh, cool. You might be <laughs> cool. We might all need to reset. Here, we go. Here, right. he, here he is. Here he is. Nice, okay. nice. All right, I'll be right back in a few. Actually, can you take my co-host first, and then I'll do it. Oh yeah. Let's see. That way it'll be easier. Boom. Shane, are you there? Testing, testing. We'll play this. Uh, I'm gonna play this video at the end here. We'll keep that on bookmark. Close. All right. Here we go. Shane, are you there? Testing. Hey, there he is. What's up, Shane? OBS crashed, which I guess now means uh, sound dies from the Twitter space, so I would have to require a rejoin. Jeez. Ooh. All right, so we had a question from, is it, uh, is it B1B? Is that who, B1B Lancer? Yes. Is that who, was yeah. it from our debate? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is the yeah, pilot that we debated. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah, welcome. Thanks for showing up. Oh. Did you see the video of the flashlight or the local source from the warehouse becoming unresolvable on the flat plane as it goes away? Uh, no, I have not. But, but regardless of not forget the warehouse, when the sun becomes un unresolvable, is it supposed to be dark then? Well, it gets dark on flat earth, right? It's something that we know. So that okay. <laughs> if the sun were to go away, then yeah, it would be unresolvable. It would be dark then. Okay. How come it's light after sunset? You mean what is twilight and dusk? Well, yeah. if you think about what daylight is, and it's actually, you know, ionized gases in the atmosphere, argon fluoresces blue, things like that, hydrogen, helium, what you have around the sun is an electromagnetic field, which would ionize the gases. And when it disperses and becomes no longer visible, its daylight field is still visible for a little while longer, right? So you're saying twilight is because of ionized gases in the atmosphere. Do you have that's, any um that's daylight for that? It's daylight, yeah. Documentation. And and if the sun is, how come the sun, if I watch a sunset, the sun doesn't get smaller? It's not fading to a point. It's the same size. Why, why, why is that? Why does the sun never appear at different size? Well, if it's never any further or closer away from you, it would probably never well, change well, angular size, right? Well, now, you just said that sunset is when the sun goes in the distance and becomes unresolvable mm -hmm. if it does that shouldn't it get smaller no why no, not? not why, why do you think it would get if smaller is this, way off in the distance doesn't it is appear like, smaller than if it's this close is, up it's like when the sun comes by it should rocket past me overhead it should just shoom right by me how come it doesn't do that right uh why would it do that <laughs> okay it's what i make sure you're not one of those people you don't think the sun should do that then on a flat earth um huh no no you think I it just should change want, angular come, size you said that the sun at sunset the sun goes way off in the distance well if something goes way off in the distance it should appear smaller way so how off. comes the sun's not smaller at sunset well i mean you know that you have flaring glaring lensing it does appear huge as it comes and then goes smaller as it goes away, but that's all an, an effect of the glare or the light as it becomes more glaring and less glaring as it comes and it goes. If you put a nice little solar filter over that, though, the tiny little dot of the actual sun would remain more or less the same, aside from the changes recorded on day and uh, timeanddate.com every day and over the year. Of course, it does change every day and over the year that's recorded there. However, if you want to just say that doesn't exist, then why would that be? Well, that's because of what the sun would be, right? The sun and the moon have the same effect in our local uh, 
local visible dome there because they never change their distance from you. They always are appearing at the same distance. That's all. That's all it is, man. You can only okay. see it if, well, if they're always appearing. When... appearing. Okay. Well, if they're always appearing at the same distance, then why are you pointing to the flashlight on the warehouse floor that when you take it really far away, it becomes unresolvable? Well, which is it? Are you taking it very far away? Well, real quick, I'll always show you distance? the other example you brought up, which was, oh, yeah. how come it doesn't ever get dark, right? And it's, oh, well, it does get dark. And as you can see in that example, here's an I, example I never of a light said it didn't. I didn't. I well, never real said quick, it. real quick. Story is swimming away, so not be dark. Real quick, right? There, there is an example. Dark. Speaking of the the factory floor, like there are examples that you can that you can do, uh, to actually show something sinking out of your field of view without losing angular size. But the sun does actually change angular size. It's just maybe less than what you're expecting, uh, but it, it it does, which Shane did point out. But yeah, we I mean we have examples of pulling something away from a camera on a on a floor. And then, or on a table, and as you pull it away, it actually sinks below below the horizon. And that's just because no, of that's just because sure of your relative that's just because of your relative position to the ground, which I which I was explaining earlier. That when you're standing on a plane, half of your sphere of vision is blocked by that plane, right? And then actually more than half, because the uh, the land in front of you or whatever is in front of you is is obscuring it's going to obscure things depending on the angular you know depending on if something is rising above your eye level or whatever but then also you're just going to things are going to converge into a point uh, into a blurry horizon where the sky appears to meet the ground the sun doesn't appear blurry at sunset it's quite distinct Maybe well sometimes it actually diffracts above the horizon line so no, the sun sun doesn't. It, I mean, you're you're giving me contradictory things. First of all, you're saying you said the distance in, inside the the dome never changes, but now you're well, saying you're, you're scattergunning different questions and topics. That's why we're giving you different answers. No, to I'm answer just I'm just repeating back to you what you said. Would you like to see a sun that gets smaller? Well, according to you, that's what you. I, I'm just asking you a simple question. Would yeah. you like to see it? Okay, there are desert shots of a setting sun to where it goes to a pinpoint, but the air is dry and the land is very flat with practically nothing in your way. And you and can see these videos and it actually drops in angular size. But you can go to the beach and you can watch the sunset and it actually appears larger as it starts to set. So have you ever, it depends have you ever on been, where you're at, atmospheric conditions, how much moisture is in the air that you're viewing the sun through. It's at a much lower angle in your uh -huh. field of view. So yeah, there's, there's lots of things to consider. Yeah, there's lots of things to consider. Like for example, when you said the sun's going to pinpoint, is the video actually showing the sun higher up in the sky and following it all the way down? What uh what kind of a camera was used? How how far was it zoomed in, zoomed out? Was it wide angle lens, telephoto? Yeah, there's lots of things to consider. You're right, but I, I've got one other question: Is that why are the constellations in the southern hemisphere completely different than the nor northern hemisphere? They all go east to west. What are you talking about? I'm I'm saying well some the smaller and larger Magellanic clouds satellite some, galaxies in the Milky Way. Some are visible, visible from the north, some are visible from the well, south. On, right? me, they they me, depend me, on the let season. Let me finish they my depend. Point. Okay. Let me finish my point. Smaller and larger Magellanic clouds, the satellite galaxies to the Milky Way, mm -hmm. they're not visible in the northern hemisphere. They are visible in the southern hemisphere. The Southern Cross constellation only visible in the Southern Hemisphere. Why is that? Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, constellations are visible independent on where you are. They're literally, because of the sky is so big, right? If you're north of the equator, you can see a different portion as when you're south of the equator. That that part, wow. that, that part may, oh, well, because you can't see forever. You can't see infinitely. Distance doesn't scale infinitely when you're from your linear perspective. Just to well, start no, with, but, right? hey, hey, real quick, real quick, 
we're gonna we're gonna let you finish your thought B one B or whatever, and then you're yeah. and, and then we're gonna dip you out, dog, because you're we're kind of well, derailing here and talking about something that's not no, related no, no, to the subject. Well, I think we should we should probably have like, more spaces like this is what I'm figuring out, so we can talk about all the other stuff that everyone wants yeah, to talk about. The, but this one was okay. supposed to be for this specific. Yeah, well, you, no, we'll definitely no. listen. Listen, guy, we're gonna let you get your final thought out. Then we're going to okay. rotate you out. When we do another okay. space that's more generalized, we'll definitely come back to this. This is supposed Thank to be you. model specific. We kind of derailed a little bit, but we're getting back on track so we can move on or wrap up here. Okay. You. All right. You're that, definitely welcome fine. when we have it open for that. Absolutely. Okay. That's right. Okay. My final thought. You're saying that, no, you can't see infinite weather. Obviously not. But you can get a really powerful telescope. Are you telling me that with the largest telescopes available, from the southern hemisphere on a flat earth, you couldn't point it to the north and see the constellations that are visible with a naked eye in the northern hemisphere? That doesn't yeah. make sense. Well, I mean, it does for a couple of reasons, right? First of all, telescopes don't make you see further. They just increase things that are unresolvable. So like, they make your resolvability, so that your angular resolution resolvability more so that things that were unresolvable become resolvable again. It's not yeah. that they weren't there. It's that you wouldn't be able to resolve it. That's what a telescope does. Second, you don't see all of the sky. Not everyone sees all of the sky. On flat Earth, yeah. if you only see half of the sky, then half yeah. of the sky would be invisible. Well, the same reason why it's night and daytime, right? Which half, half of the sky is in night, half of the sky is in, in light. What, what do you mean? If I'm a no, 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 no. If I'm in the southern hemisphere and a constellation's in the northern hemisphere on your flat Earth, it should be visible. Well, no, you can't see. It's supposed to be final thoughts, so if you want to. Yeah. You want well, to wrap that's my it final up. thought, but thanks for not answering my question. Well, You're very he, welcome. Well, he answered it, and then it led to another one, which leads to another one, which leads to another one, which isn't the purpose of this space, sir. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, anyone else have any questions regarding the model or the objects in the sky? Did Did you want to do B1B, quick... To be fair, with B and B understanding op, how optics works is kind of like prerequisite for understanding this model. Uh, now, but I would also say that, you know, uh, we have literally like five videos all about the topic of optics. Uh, we, you know, it's a very, if you want it to be, it can be a very deep topic that we can go into, but just understanding the way that something that we can't see forever. And that if you like on a plane, in a plane earth, a plane, our earth with a plane, our sky, the fact that they would literally do what we see, especially as, as Shane already submitted that we see in a uh, we see in a radius of thirty nine fifty nine, uh, like if you can't steel man that position, the fact that seeing in a radius of thirty nine fifty nine would make an apparent globe, then uh, then I would you know I would just ask that you go uh, you know if you if you're looking for us to point you to some resources, we'd be happy to do it, and then maybe come back when you can steel man that position, and then you can point out to us the flaws in our position or uh, or something along those lines, but to just try and uh, derail this whole conversation into it. Some of us get it, some of us don't, and I don't fault anyone for not getting it. Um, but uh, but just try to try to uh, do the thought experiment at some point. Try to actually steel man our position before you come in here and and argue with us. Also, he's always welcome. That dude was our first debate for a, and I think that was a structured format from which to be introduced. But you're welcome to come have you know cordial discussions all the time, man. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I, although I, I didn't like the way he would uh, uh, like interrupt you while you were talking, but we can right. that. <laughs> let's do uh, the Southern Cross real quick since no one's asking about it. And it's kind of what we want to show you, right? There's the wonderful observation of the Southern Cross from three Southern continents at the same UTC, right? Everyone's familiar with what I'm talking about? Maybe questions? Yeah, so I'm sorry. Say that again. So you're you're setting up a southern yeah. star cross from three observation points, and then how how are all the observers looking in different directions on the globe and and or right. flat Earth? Great. Yeah, one of my all favorites. Right. Yeah. All right. While you're covering this, I'm going to be AFK for a second. So. Yep. All right. Go ahead. Let me get some stuff in the jumbotron. Let's see. So. Uh, let me find my screenshots here because I know it's one of the best things that everyone likes to bring up. But how does it possibly work on flat Earth? And it's like, well, it's super easy, actually, right? If you look at the model over here and we put, say, an observer, let's put a Western Australia, he would see, let's say that we have a star, a cluster of stars that represent, let's say it's this one. It doesn't matter because they aren't real and they're all the same. Let's say it's this one. 
But this person would see it right over here. Let's say it's this little star right here, right on his southern horizon looking south. That's exactly where it would appear. And let's keep track of it as we move again. We're not going to move time. We're just going to move our observer. So we're going to go this way. We're going to go back to Africa right over here. We're going to look at the same star. It's going to be right above him right over here, this green green dot. There it is. <laughs> there it is. So it hasn't moved. It's in, it's in the sky. And we're going to move our observer back to the South America, the last observation point where it is just barely nighttime. And he will see it right over here looking south. Right over here is where he sees it. Right over there. So they're all looking south, southwest. They're all seeing the same southern cross, they're seeing it at different elevations, at different peaks, but at the same time, technically, from flat Earth. So that's super cool. Do we have questions? We've been doing this for quite a while. So yeah, it looks like we're going on about two hours here now. Go ahead, GT. I saw you open your mic. You are always free to speak. Man. Yeah, I grabbed my I grabbed my computer because I was having some issues, some technical issues. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a couple questions. I had to get the kids down. You know, that's half the reason why I'm even doing what I'm doing is because I have three small children, and I just want to tell them the truth of where they live and try to figure this whole thing out because if Flat Earth was just totally stupid, it would have been canned a long time ago. And so it's been fun to investigate. Um, if I jumped all the way back to the gentleman that brought up the drone and he was saying like the sun will appear to set and, you know, I really appreciate everybody that's been cordial with their questions. And he's like, Hey, but if I take my drone up, I can see it for like exactly two more minutes. My hypothesis is that if you take a drone and you go up, you know, 200 or 500 or thousand, you know, feet, that would be a bigger, that would be a bigger earth. Like the earth would have a bigger radius if you're viewing from there. And it, it, it seems that the, like the grid of vision would be a little bit extended. So you're being able to see that sun slipping away on a larger grid of vision because the way the earth was calculated was ground level. Am, am I right in thinking that? Yeah. I mean, that's the only way that it makes sense to me is like if we see the sun set and the sun is optically doing that, if you take a drone up, then of course, you know, you may be able to see it again. But I wanted to circle back to that just because that, that's what was bouncing around in my head. Um, but concerning the model specifically, uh, I understand that like Bislin did it as like a joke or was trying to like rub it in our faces. But what data did he use? Because quite a bit of it is exactly how we see, you know, the apparent sun, sun and moon go by or the stars. So a lot of it's right. And I, and the, the wrong part was when the bendy light ray lines were bent all the way up to a sun that ultimately he was saying like, well, if you had a sun over a flat earth, everybody could see it at the right time <laughs> or at the same time. Is that correct? Yeah. And the definite flat earth or uh, anti-flat earth, the misunderstanding of the sun, but attributing all them heliocentric attributes to it and then seeing like, oh, I can't see how it works. Like, right. I, I, I got it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I mean, this whole thing is amazing. Uh, I wanted to, to ask B1B or whatever, like the attitude that I think you need to bring to this is a, if you can imagine, because I think it is a stationary topographical plane. First, you have to put yourself on an extended plane. That's not moving. Like if you're going to enter this space to even discuss, you know, where we, where we're living, then you have to say, how could it be possible to see a sun, appearing to rise, hitting a zenith, and going down and setting. If we're on a plane, the answer would be, well, because it's optical. That's how it looks to us. And I really appreciate all the hard work you guys have been pouring into reading papers. You know, people have been debating and, and talking about, um, you know, geocentrism. They've been talking about uh, the flat earth since the early 1900s. And it's been a, a, a waging war with books and studies and uh, I just like that you guys are bringing not just uh, what you think, but you're looking at papers and analyzing what people before you thought. And um, it's exciting, man, because like if, if we're wrong, like if flat earthers are just dumb, that's going to be totally fine. Just show us the proof of the globe, show us the proof of motion. And I'm going to adopt that back because I want to I want to show my kids what's real and what's true. 
And to me, obviously, the heliocentric model is based on philosophy and can't be proven. So that's why I think all these people are looking into this. So thank you. Awesome, as always, JT. Also, thanks for the coffee cup caustic thing I just noticed that you sent me other men. <laughs> yeah, man. I think that's all I got. Pass the mic. Thanks, Mayor. I gotta give him this title. <laughs> Call him Mayor or May for short. Like, what up, May? I like mayor. It sounds professional. Like, yes, Mayor. I will Mayor. Right away, mayor. No, you guys are funny. <laughs> oh, I got, I got one more thing. Last thing. The gentleman that was asking about like the moon and how it was like relating to the background stars from Homeboy in the North and somebody in the South. Um, well, one mistake would be if you can't stop seeing people like on a globe, that's that's a problem. But if you can envision them on a plain Earth, the first question I would ask people, everybody listening is, hey, does the sun and the moon look different than the stars and the wandering stars. And if you're like, well, yeah, like the sun's super bright, it feels hot. It's like, it's, it's intense. And the moon is like a different color light, but both those, both those luminaries are big, like they're different. And so if somebody's in the, in the north of the equator and somebody's in the south of the equator and they're close enough to see the moon, it's just like that, uh, the, like a six on the ceiling where the person taking the picture in the north is going to have a, an upside down picture of the person take it in the south. And that's kind of a, a cool optical thing. But if, if the sun and the moon do look slightly different to the background stars, I would just say that the background stars may be in a different location outside the azimuthal grid of vision. And the way, it, like the bottom line here, people, is the way all the, all the heavens, all the stars, all the luminaries, the way they present to us is what they've been doing for thousands of years. And I think it's awesome. Uh, I do think we live on a plane, you know, a stationary topographical plane Earth. And uh, exactly how it works and what the model exactly is, is going to be difficult to, to get because we're just starting like 10 years into this thing, like us, like the people on the panel. I don't think anybody's longer than 15 years looking into it because it, it we just w awoken from the, the from the deception. But... Um, you know, what we're fighting against is billions of dollars and almost 500 years of peer-reviewed studies and papers and, and analyzation of the sky. But every time somebody's looked at the sky, they're using optics, they're using telescopes, they're using their eyes, and they're getting data of what Shane is presenting. You know, he's not just some dumb flat earther that's just making something up. Like, the night sky is, is the puzzle piece that we do have. And uh, the real question is, what's under our feet? And we're all digging at that. So anyway, I'm not going to ramble anymore, but I love y'all. Hmm. Thanks for being truthers. Nice, JT. Thanks, man. Dude. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot. I forgot his title. Man, I got to remember. Dude, you remember that uh, when we were going through the Royal Society and we were talking about the uh, collimation mode? Or what, was it? what was it called? The collimate? When the, the old school Gs had to denote the edges of their azimuthal grid of vision? Oh, are you talking about when they founded the azimuthal grid? Right. By looking yeah. at one horizon and then flipping the telescope 180 degrees and doing it opposite. Exactly, exactly that. Yeah, yeah. I remember so that. It's almost like yeah, before, because someone said about the moon and its parallax, but it's important to note before they invented longitude and the need for it sub subsequently, they used something called like the lunar transit method to get around and to not celestially navigate. And what that was, was they'd mark the moon as it passed by certain stars. Literally, they could see which stars it occulted and then know how, how long it had passed since between that and between that and Jupiter's moon's method and just the dead, dead reckoning they managed to get along without any longitude just nicely. But the point is they, uh, they looked at something called the clock stars, which are like these really bright stars that the moon, the moon would pass by and then it would transit those with how they would tell time and be able to navigate. So the parallax behind the moon and the net stars is something that I don't understand this question because it's, it's been known and used and exploited and navigated by for at least a couple hundred years. So. Wow, I did not know that about the... Uh, yeah, but if you assume transit. his exact medium, his exact refractive index, his exact distance, and his exact sizes, then it's all it's all real. It all <laughs> you you could tell because well, he was like, but it matches heliocentrism. It's well, like they, observations. <laughs> well, not to... Th th that's, how they, that's how they got us, though, right? 
they get us with these fantastical distances and attribute meaning to them. And we forget the significance of the practical application of what, of what it is, right? We completely overlook the fact that none of that matters. And it's all about a local personalized azimuthal grid that two observers can use to navigate on a coordinate system that was given us, given to us by the King in 1777. Shout out to the King. <laughs> Hooked us up with that. Yeah, only... so hooked us up with that universal lat long, dude. I mean, I'm mad, no but you also any other you know. <laughs> yeah. Also, you can't use any others, but you're you're all set. You can have this one. I'm mad, but I can't be too mad, right? He, they did do a very <laughs> impressive feat. When you go over the history of how they <clears throat> made the lat long system, it's fascinating. Shane did a whole whole thing on it. Check yeah, it out on Ether does. Cosmology. It's called Finding Latitude or. Where did I put my latitude longitude? I forget what it's titled, but go to <laughs> go to go to YouTube, Ether Cosmology, and type longitude the, in the search feature, and you'll find the history of it. It's really fascinating. It sure is. Yeah, Alan, it was so good. I uh, I re-uploaded it to my channel. I don't have very many videos, but I do. I'm going to be putting up more and more of people having great conversations. I'm going to be clipping stuff, and uh, soon. In the near future, uh, I'm going to start doing interviews with people, just like talking about, you know, what do they think and their truth or journey. And I mean, really, this is about this whole movement is about connecting back to people connecting because the world, it seems like, has been push, pushing division. Like, let's divide over everything. Let's be angry at each other uh, anyway. So, yeah, you can go to youtube.com forward slash at run Boston Bear and you can find that longitude latitude video like not very far down. Dude, big, mm, yeah, big. And I recommend I do recommend his his cut because it's a, it's a nice, uh, well edited audio track. It's epic. Yeah. yeah. If you go to run Boston Bears YouTube channel and type dude, where's my longitude? It'll come up and you can watch, <laughs> watch the video. Hey, I stole that joke from Big Pine Sailing. Shout out to him in the chat. That was hilarious. Dude, I've been, I've been laughing ever since I read that. Oh, I see that when I kicked out my OBS, my Twitter stream stopped. I was like, was it only three? Oh, it reset like three times. That's going to be annoying, dude, when I do Flat Earth Fridays. Got to get that nine-hour stream to compete with Alan. Yeah, dude, I've, I've been enjoying Flat Earth, uh, uh, Flat Earth Fridays and then uh, Stationary Saturdays, Sacred, and Proud Flurf have been just opening it up to anybody. And, man, they've done, what, 12, even 17-hour streams, so... This is definitely a topic uh, that I find very fun to talk about. As long as people can stay chill, like there's no reason to get angry. We're just talking about what could be, I guess, uh, you know, that's that's my thing is let's just talk about it, not use ad homs and get angry about it. Absolutely, bro. Well said. Cool. So. If, if anyone else has any questions, comments, or anything for the <clears throat> for the model or anything, if not, we're probably going to wrap up. Then we'll go through the TL later, post links and tag everything, et cetera. Yep. Uh, more so of a question. Not more so of a comment than a question. I, I, first of all, I'll shout out to you guys for rolling with the punches. <laughs> How many times can you say something over and over and over? And they're like, you didn't answer my question. I'm like, all right. He, he kind of did like five times. But all right. Anyway, um, I think I think the people struggle because of, of what you said. They can't get that other model out of their head as they're listening to you, to you talk about optics and how our, our grid of vision works. Um, my, my oversimplified analogy is that uh, if you see a rainbow, uh, it probably may, may be way too oversimplified, but it kind of works the same way. No, this we is a great analogy, bro. Like you said it the other day, and I really like it. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Let's let's um the, for the audience. What I said was, if we all see a rainbow, we can't. We can generally see where the where the rainbow is in our grid of vision, and we can kind of model that at, model that. But we couldn't triangulate exactly where that is. Uh, kind of like the the impression of the globe of a physical object of a celestial body. If that is presupposed that it's a celestial object, we can understand that. But all we know is that rainbow is apparent. What we know a rainbow is only apparent. We know it's not a physical object because we know what a rainbow is. Um, we, we don't assert what the sun is. That's one thing that these guys are great at. They only talk about what they can prove and they know for a fact that the celestial body is apparent. So you can, you can model out 
a, a grid of vision to a rainbow, but you can triangulate. That triangulation, you got to get out of your head. That is the indoctrination. They will say over and over and over, but we can triangulate from these three locations. No, you can't. Well, <laughs> that well, well hold on. If you impose conditions on the rainbow, you definitely can, right? And that's, what they, and, that, and that's what they did, right? They were like, okay, well, if we say the rainbow is this far away relative to your position, now we can set up our two-party position. That's what they did. It was all about, in exactly. 1777, the whole thing was getting people to use a rainbow to, to navigate, right? So we get two people to do it. If we can get two people to do it, then we're then we're golden. And that's what the whole thing was about in 1777. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Shout out to you guys, man. I love that's that analogy because it's like, oh... If you think like if, if you're gonna assert the people that are asserting that we should be able to assert or we should be able to triangulate positions of these apparent things, like literally they're the same like okay, well then go get me the pot of gold from the end of the rainbow. Like that's like literally the same level of of logic. Kind of hilarious. Do we let did you have your finish? He uh, No, that's all I had to say. I, I was I landed it right there. You guys you guys uh you guys are awesome. Keep it up though. Thanks, bro. We love we love listening to what you have to say too. You get some gravy all the time. It's good to follow. It's good to have a crew of competent people who are all like <laughs> proficient at things. You know what I mean? Love it. Yeah. So, uh, any other questions, thoughts before we wrap up the space here? All right then. All right. If there's no further questions before you do our outro, Toby, I'm going to be, I'm going to be playing a 10 minute video at the end that somebody requested I play. I have, I'm not really sure what it is or what it's about, but if you're interested in that mystery and solving that, uh, stick around. I'll be playing it on Twitter or whatever. You can watch it on there. You can watch it on YouTube if you're on YouTube. But um, after he wraps mm -hmm. up the outro, I'm going to play that video. Yeah. yeah, you can go watch that on his stream. He's referring to not yep. not in the Twitter space itself. I'll go ahead and close that out once i do the outro here uh but yeah so everyone thank you so much for being here i'm not so sure how this recorded space is going to sound because i was having audio issues hearing people from the actual space but you can check it out over on uh shane's platforms on uh, bitshoot and odyssey and rumble uh you can also check out alan's platforms on rumble and youtube uh and yeah, check out Space Audits, and then I'll be mirroring the Space Audits uh, stream over to the Ether Cosmology channels as well. But yeah, so thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you have questions, just ping us. We'll do our best to get to them, especially if you're respectful. Uh, and uh, yeah, tomorrow night we're going to be doing an Ether Roundtable. It's going to be hosted by uh, mostly by Alan, I believe. Possibly, I believe Man of Stone is going to pop in as well. We're going to have some discussion about kinematics and dynamics and the difference between the two and the meaning between the two. And then we're also going to do a little bit of a dive into some of Man of Stone's videos and discuss those and do a little bit of a, a discussion with Man of Stone about those videos. And then also, so that'll be tomorrow uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And then on Thursday nights, we do reading. We do live reading and research. That usually starts at around 9 or 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll join us for that on Thursday. And then also, of course, on Friday, there is Flat Earth Fridays. So I'm sure many of us will see many of you there. And, uh, yeah. When, think, uh, one final ahead. note. Yes, well, I, think, I don't think I said it the whole time, but this model isn't for me to use. It's for everyone in the community to use, to pick it up in a debate, to show a glory, to do whatever. It's literally to explain the unexplainable. So the things that Flat Earth couldn't explain, you know, the, the sun, the moon, eclipses, sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moonset, all the things that were tough to explain. That's, that's what it's for and for anyone to grab. So thanks, everyone, for coming and for asking pretty good questions. Take care, y'all. Thanks again for being here. Yeah, you can stick around right here. I'm about to play it here in a second. <clears throat> Hold on.
Yo, what's up, Toby? I'm still alive right now. I'm about to stream this video. Do you want to watch it? Yeah, heck yeah. All right, All right cool. Waiting for Shane real quick to see if he'll join us. All right, I'm going to go ahead and assume he immediately went to go take out his dog or something. So we're just going to play this mm. out. He can cool. he can tag in if it uh, comes back. All right, distribution of the stars in the upper Fermi. Well, that went well. Oh, hey, you're back. Well, uh, I'm, I'm about to play this video out that somebody wanted me to play uh, regarding the stars and the firmament and stuff, if you want to check it out. I'm playing it now, if you want to join the thing and watch it. Yeah, still, we I'm are still... live on Space Audit still. Yep. Let me know when you're ready. I'm good. Okay, playing it in now. Oh, so it was um, distribution of the stars in the firmament. I put this on uh, 2x play speed.
Nice, bro. Thank you for the video. Thoughts, anyone? That stuff about the star distribution is really interesting. Uh, I'm going to have to look into that some more. I'm going to need that link. Yeah, I'm going to check that out. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Here's the link in the chat. Or, yeah, chat. There we go. And then that link one more time for anyone who wants it on the YouTubes. All right. Nice. All right, cool. So Toby already outro us out, and we were, we were going to exit on that video. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll be live tomorrow at 7 to discuss kinematics and dynamics.